is 7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. So members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam Blank. Here. Good evening to all of you. Uh, here on behalf of the town, uh, Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. I'm here. Good to have you with us. Um, is there someone appearing on behalf of 189 Forest Street? Yes, hi, how are you? My name is Ilya Zvinikarotsky. I'm one of the owners of 189 Forest Street. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, in, on behalf of 212 Pleasant Street, is Akin head with us tonight? She is. Yes, we're here. Yeah, we're here. Great, thank you. Um, uh, someone here on behalf of 1618 Plymouth Street. Mr. Pesciuto here? Yes, we're here. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and uh, on behalf of 106 Mount Vernon Street, uh, is Sean Snyder? Yes, we're here. Oh, thank you. And on behalf of 121 Park Avenue, uh, Lena Krishnakar? Yeah, this is Bala. I'm her husband. I'm here. Oh, hi. Great. Thank you so much. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into the law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So I would like to start tonight's meeting. Um, uh, so very briefly, we I am pleased to announce that the select board voted on March 6th to approve an, a well-credentialed member of our town to fill the open associate position on the board. I would like to introduce him to the board and ask him to briefly introduce himself. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce Adam LeBlanc. Adam. 
Good evening. Uh, yeah, so my name is Adam LeBlanc. I'm a resident over in East Arlington. Uh, I am a registered architect in the state of Massachusetts for about four years now. Um, I work at a, a firm uh, downtown that we focus on uh, affordable and um, elderly housing in the state of Massachusetts. Um, grew up on the North Shore, uh, been around this this area for my whole life, so um, very vested interest in in uh, in this town and and uh, looking forward to contributing to it. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of the board, welcome you to the board and truly appreciate your volunteer service to the town. So before opening tonight's uh, hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves for themselves and to make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, the first item on our agenda this evening is docket number 3731-189 4th Street. This is a continuance of a prior hearing and the applicant has filed a letter requesting to withdraw. So with that, I would introduce Ilya to um, explain what their intention is. Yes, good evening. Um, how is everybody doing today? Um, we are requesting to withdraw the doubt prejudice, um, our application. We are have made a decision to pursue renovation um, by right. So that's why we're seeking to withdraw our application. Thank you. So the so just to be clear, so the intention is that you're going to be moving forward with renovations, but none of the renovations would require a special permit from the Board of Appeals. That is correct. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the board in this regard? Seeing none. Um, I move to accept the request for withdrawal of the special permit application for 189 Forest Street without prejudice. Second. A second. Second. Any questions from the board on the, what the vote is? Seeing none, roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So motion to withdraw on behalf of 189 Forest Street is accepted. Thank you very much for appearing this evening. Um, and good luck with the renovations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, Patrick Hanlon uh, for the next item on our agenda, which is docket 3733-212 Pleasant Street. Oh, Pat, you're on mute. <clears throat> Thank you. I I guess I can't say thank you, Mr. Chairman, because for the next few minutes, I am Mr. Chairman. Um, the next case is uh, from 212 uh, Pleasant Street. We've received a letter from the applicant uh, announcing her intention to uh, withdraw. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the applicant is present. I'd like to call on her to uh, reaffirm her intentions and say whatever she has to say about it before we do what we just did. Nelly, are you here? I'm here. Thank you. So we are uh, respectfully requesting that our application for a special <clears throat> permit for 212 Pleasant Street be withdrawn. Okay. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, um, <clears throat> the chair will entertain a motion to uh, accept the uh, request to withdraw the application without prejudice. So moved. Mr. Moved by Mr. DuPont. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by, I think, Mr. Riccadelli. Um, we'll do the roll. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Ms., Mr. Klein? 
I'm sorry, Mr. McLean is, is recused on this case, which is why I'm doing it. Ms. Hoffman? Uh, aye. Uh, Mr. Holy? Aye. Uh, Mr. And Mr. Riccardelli, have I? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye, and the motion is withdrawn. Be, before I turn this back to uh, Mr. Klein, I should point out that uh, Mr. Holy has uh, reviewed the trans has reviewed the te the video of the proceeding uh, and has filed a suitable affidavit under the Mullen rule to enable him to vote on this application. So thank you, Mr. Holy. And the chair, the temporary expedient chair, will turn it back over to the real chair, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Can I make a quick request? Yeah. Uh, because of uh, the two um, the two votes we just made of uh, withdrawal, I just thought since there's been a good amount of um, neighborhood feedback, mm -hmm. uh, you could just quickly explain uh, how uh, those applicants may move forward, uh, you know, without our board's approval. Oh, certainly. Um, so in both those cases, the applicants had applied for a special permit, um, which in both cases was for a large addition. So it's an addition that's larger than 750 square feet outside the footprint of the house. And the um, in both cases, there was uh, opposition from the neighborhood in regards to those applications. And after further consideration, the applicants have decided not to pursue a special permit. That does not mean that nothing will happen on those properties, um, but it does mean that uh, they no longer would require a, 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 a special permit for a large addition. So if the you know, application if it was for an addition that was 740 square feet, that would not require a special permit from this board. Um, and there are, there are other things that would require a special permit, but in this case, um, my understanding from both the applicants is that they do intend to do renovations to those buildings, but just to an extent that they would not require a special permit from this board and they would be fully compliant with the requirements of the zoning bylaw. So thank you, Mr. Kickdale. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Could I just add to that, that especially in, and I have no idea what the intentions of either of these applicants are, so this is general and not related to their case, but uh, people should understand that one of the options that one can have rather than doing a large addition is to tear a structure down and to re rebuild it. And for that, you don't need a special permit so that it's not just a matter that they could do something, but it's less than what they've already proposed. It's possible that that if other, depending upon the zoning ordinance and various other things, it's possible that they could do more. So uh, this is all this is, is they don't have the special permit to do what they asked to do, but it's impossible to predict really whether what what will ultimately happen down the line, either because of what these applicants or because of anybody who owns the property in the future and seeks to develop it in some other way. Well, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And just to in, in further than that as well, any application to the town is a public record and um, is kept on file at inspectional services and can be requested through the open records law or by visiting inspectional services down on Maple Street. Um, so with that, we have next item is item number four on our agenda, which is docket 3736, 1618 Plymouth Street. Um, so if the applicant could please introduce themselves and I will uh, bring up the record submitted to the board. So I, my name is Anthony Pesciuto. I am the applicant on 1618 Forest Street, I mean, Plymouth Street. Um, we are looking to add a second driveway on our property. Our property is centered on the lot we, and we have sufficient amounts of space to the left and right to create two separate driveways and free up open space in the backyard. This is the application that was um, submitted to the town. I will go ahead. Oops. I can't 
zoom in a little bit on this. There we go. So the image on the left is the current condition and the image yeah. on the right is the proposed condition. Um, exactly. And so the intent is to demolish the existing garage, is that correct? Yes. And this portion of the drive, uh, the portion of the driveway beyond what's indicated here. So this would remain, this would be added, and then everything back here would be removed. So we're freeing up basically the whole backyard space in order to create a full backyard and create an open space in the backyard without having parking back there. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions on visiting the site. So this here on the plan is a fire hydrant, which appears to yep. be in the way of the driveway. What is the intention with that? So I met with DPW and the intention was to actually relocate it. So wherever the piping is running, we'd relocate it to be about probably five feet to the right or five feet to the left, mattering on where the piping is running. Okay. And also, so this, the, the right side property line, I believe the adjacent property is significantly lower. Um, it is. So there's it's a not wall here. It, we do have a retaining wall at the moment. Okay. And has it, is it certified that it could take the loading of vehicles parked in that area? So my architect has proposed for us to, to actually drop the um, driveway down on that right side to be level with the, um, the, the adjacent lot. Um, that way we do not have to have the retaining wall and it can really take on the load of what we're trying to accomplish. And the are there any trees on that side of the property that um, would be removed as a part of that? So there's a, there is a few dead trees that mm -hmm. would have to be removed, um, but nothing living at the moment for, uh, for trees. Okay. And it, has that been um, has that information been discussed with the tree warden? To not. the best of your knowledge? Okay. It has not. Okay. And I believe. And whatever we, it, 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 what we have discussed is um, whatever we need to it, propose to replace anything, even the dead trees that we would be removing, mm -hmm. um, we have no problem replacing things in the rear of the lot. Okay. Great, thank you. Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont? So I can't really see the dimensions all that well, but on the proposed driveway side to the right, um, what, is the width, what is the width between the building and the lot line? at that narrowest point? That narrowest point is nine foot nine inches. Um, and I, I've driven by a couple of times and I have to say, you know, to my eye, which is not necessarily accurate, it looks pretty narrow. And um, is there also going to be, there's supposed to be a buffer zone between the pavement, the paved surface, and the adjoining property, is that calculated in what you're showing us? It is. And could you explain what those dimensions are? Because you have to have a certain pavement width, do you not, for the driveway? And then you have to have a buffer zone. So what are the dimensions on those? So we actually propose two feet of buffer zone from the right of the driveway. And and I'm not entirely clear that that's sufficient. It may be three feet. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know if you've confirmed that with the building department. 
I have, and I, I've done a few actual, I've actually done a few projects where the building department um, has given us the clearance for two feet, uh, two feet off the right side or less and, mattering on where. Okay, fair enough. And, and I noticed too, and I can't comment on whether or not the trees are living, but there are some fairly substantial trees toward the back of the parking area that you're showing. I don't know if they're in it or they're behind it. But just in driving by, right. I noticed that they're there. I don't know whether they're entirely on the property that you have or whether they're on the property next door. But that's something, obviously, that needs to be determined. Yep. So as of right now, my architect has proposed the drawings to um, the driveways to be extended a little bit further than what we actually need for Arlington Code. So it's... Um, we can shorten the driveway to be 52 feet from where the front of our lot sits. That way, everything's up to code regarding the driveway <clears throat> and having sufficient amount of parking for each unit. Um, with that being said, I think we've proposed about 60 feet deep on the drawings currently to give them that extra space, but we can reduce eight feet off of that proposed drawing. Right. And and I think that the calculations that we've used in the past are, you know, dimensions from the, um, I think we've seen it's got to be 18 feet in length for the two parking spaces, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know yep. from what you're describing whether or not you conform with that. Yes. Um. Okay, uh, those are the questions I had, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Duplant. Other questions from the board? No. Not see any further questions from the board. No questions. No questions. Uh, Oh, I would like to ask. So I will now open this meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. And please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for a first time to speak first. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or we have reached the time of the 8.15, um, the public comment period will be closed. Uh, board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. So um, if you would like to speak to this, uh, please raise your hand. Several. Uh, people with their hands raised. So the first name is uh, Benjamin Moynihan. If you could give your name and address for the record. Good evening, everyone and members of the board. Um, my name is Benjamin Moynihan. I live at 7 Plymouth Street in Arlington. I've been a resident of 7 Plymouth Street since 2012 uh, and greatly appreciate this opportunity to participate in this uh, discussion about the proposed uh, special permit for 1618 Plymouth Street. Um, before I raise my, my questions and comments for the, for the board members, um, I would like to say that uh, as a neighbor on, on Plymouth Street, um, which is a, a wonderful little neighborhood <laughs> in Arlington, um, many of us were really thrilled by the renovation of this property. Um, it had been, um, let's say, undertended for many years. And uh, so the fact that 
folks wanted to spruce it up um, is is a is a boon, um, I think, for for all of us. Um, that that said, um, I I do have a couple concerns about this permit, and I have one point of information, point of fact that I wanted to clarify. I believe in the original uh, or earlier permit request when um, the folks that are renovating the property uh, asked to build the extension on the back of the house, that the proposal to um, remove the garage was already part of that plan. So that's not a new thing, I don't think. That's a, that's a question to the board. Do you guys know whether that's new or whether that was part of a previous plan? And I have a few other comments. I, I do not know the sequence on that. Okay. Um, so the second thing is um, my my own sense, and I'm not expert in this, but um, there are um, large trees on either side of where the fire hydrant is located at the edge of the road. And my concern is that if you move the fire hydrant five feet to the left or five feet to the right, one would impinge on the root systems of those older trees. And, you know, Arlington has made a commitment to uh, net zero uh, by 2050, I believe, and uh, we don't want to lose any trees to sort of further hinder our pathway to a net zero. On a related note, I'm not aware that any of the trees between the two properties are in fact dead. I'm not a tree expert. I do see them have leaves in the warmer months of the year. That doesn't mean that I know that they don't have dead limbs, but I don't believe that they are dead in the sense of no leaves at all and stuff is falling down any more than a natural tree would, <laughs> you know, occasionally need trimming. Um, and there are several trees uh, between the two properties. I think there's about four or five major trees back there that provide significant shade uh, in that, that area. And of course, the trees on the road do as well. So we would not want to lose any of them if, it, if, if at all possible. Um, the other thing is that um, I'm not aware, on Plymouth Street at least, there are no other properties that have two driveways on either side of the properties. Um, so in terms of the character uh, of the property, and this is still appreciating the green space that's being created by removing the garage in the back, whether or not this special permit is granted, that is greatly appreciated. Um, but the two driveways, you know, as, as the person, um, the folks noted in their application, they are trying to make accommodation for the, they recognize that they will be creating more runoff by putting pavement there. So anyway, that's that's a concern, um, and I think that's all. I'll, I'll I'll stop right there, and I see several of my uh, neighbors on the line as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, then I'll move next on the uh, docket here um, is Howard Rudinsky. Thanks uh, very much for the uh, opportunity to speak and uh, express my opinion. I'm Howard Rudzinski. I live at 11 and 13 Plymouth Street, so I'm uh, diagonal across, one house over. I've been a resident in this property since 1999. And uh, to echo what Ben said, we have a terrific street with terrific neighbors, and we are certainly grateful for the new owner and developer of this property and restoring and renewing it. Um, that being said, uh, I, I, I do have a couple of questions. I, I just wanna understand, I, I also agree, I don't think those two trees that are in the driveway space are dead. Uh, they are large and they are older trees. Um, and, and am I mistaken um, that the developer owner, you mentioned that you want to lower that side of the driveway so it is at the same level as Andy and Betsy's property uh, immediately adjacent. So that would make a, a driveway on the right-hand side that would be significantly lower 
than the left hand side? Did, did I not hear that? That was what he had indicated. Yes. Well, well, it, just just think about that for a second. That doesn't pass the eyeball test. So you have one driveway on the left side that is higher than the other. Um, aside from the fact that none of us, and I own a two family, 1113 across, none of us have two driveways. And so would I like to have a driveway on the other side of my house for my tenants? Sure I would, um, but I think it would change the character of the street, of the houses and of the neighbors. But beyond that, the eyeball test of, if you look at it, I can't see how there would be two feet of space on the side of the house. It just doesn't pass the eyeball test. The driveway that you would have, depending upon how far that retaining wall goes over and is the property of 1618 versus a shared retaining wall with the adjacent property, there's no way that there is enough room to have two cars there um, and, and a separate driveway. It just doesn't look right. There, there is nothing about that that passes even an eyeball test, let alone a, you know, a formal zoning rules test. Um, and I personally object to it strenuously. I don't think it's, it's a good idea. There's plenty of yard space in the back. Other neighbors have turnarounds. Uh, we certainly appreciate the, the desire of the developer to have yard space and that would make the property more marketable and two driveways as well and potentially increasing their own um, you know, revenue from the sale and development of the property. But I don't think that that is the neighborhood's concern so much as keeping the character of the neighborhood and not trying to shoehorn a driveway into that side. It, 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 it just doesn't pass the eyeball test. And, and I would agree with Ben on the fire hydrant as well, you know, possibly interrupting or intruding or ruining, you know, the, the, the root systems of two older growth trees and the two trees that are adjacent to Andy and Betsy's property in the driveway presently. Uh, I've been living here 20 years. They seem to blossom every year. There seem to be leaves on them every year. So again, I, I don't think this is a well-advised idea uh, to put a driveway on that second side. And, and I firmly object to it and object to this petition. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, next up is uh, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I. Uh, Appreciate the comments of uh, both Mr. Monahan and Mr. Rudinsky. Um, Rudinsky, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, about the trees in particular, which of course is always my uh, primary concern. Uh, moving the fire hydrant anywhere near the large trees would, of course, uh, disrupt uh, the health of those trees because to put in a fire hydrant means you dig down deep and sever probably some main roots with the trees. So I'm not sure. Um, that that's a, not only not, am I guessing it's not a good idea, it's uh, not according to the town's uh, bylaw that, that uh, a development cannot damage trees that are a public owned uh, property, street trees, uh, as part of the process of development. Um, although I, I, I'm a little surprised to hear that uh, the DPW was. Uh, was aligned with that approach because I think they, they kind of know this already, the tree warden is an employee of the DPW. Uh, also with the trees uh, that have been mentioned by the previous speakers, they are within the setbacks. They would require a tree warden to sign off. There has to be a tree plan created um, for uh, their protection during construction. And if they are to be taken, there would be a significant related fee for that because they are protected trees as long as they're six inches or greater in uh, diameter at breast height. Uh, as to whether they're alive or not, that's something the uh, tree warden would have to determine for, for the applicant. Um, the trees often look dead, but as one of the previous speakers said, sometimes it's just a question of uh, poor trimming and maintenance. And um, that probably is something which can be easily remediated then. 
the trees, as I said, are protected under the bylaw. So, um, and just as a um, not related to trees, the idea of putting driveways on both sides of the house in the neighborhood where uh, two family houses are serviced by long driveways on one side and spaces in back. Um, the look of a house with cars parked on both sides of it is quite a bit different than the look of a house of cars parked either behind it or on one side of it. And uh, I am uh, sympathetic to what I'm hearing from the uh, neighbors saying it really is not with the character. It's, it's going to make quite a bunch of uh, pavement in the, the front and side yards of the houses. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, next up is Ellen Kushner. Oh, Ms. Kushner, you're on mute. I have to unmute myself. Um, hi, I'm Ellen Kushner. I live at 30 Highland Ave. I've lived there since 1996. I'm also a residential architectural designer. Um, so I wanted to just weigh in on this proposal. I, I echo what my neighbors have already said about the fact that we're that I'm pleased to see that this house is being renovated and that some you know new um, construction is injecting some much needed care into this this building. That said, um, Plymouth Street is a very short street with only a dozen houses that is um, not heavily trafficked and it's always been a street where kids have played in the street. And adding another driveway where people are going to be pulling out and potentially um, you know, causing more disruption and more danger to the children, I think is something that we really have to consider. Um, I also echo the fact that uh, there is no precedent on this street for two driveways on either side of a house. Um, every single house on this street has similar problems. There are only um, two single family houses on this block. So every other house is a two family house and they all have to grapple with juggling cars in the driveway. It's just a fact of life. Um, I wanna speak about 22 Plymouth Street because um, that is the adjacent property. I know the owners also wanna speak, um, but that property slopes back, uh, slopes quite precipitously from the sidewalk heading back toward the back of the property. So even if, the new owners propose to lower the driveway. And I do agree that it's going to look very strange to have driveways on either side of the street, one of which is significantly lower than the other. Um, hardscaping that area will definitely create a drainage problem in the sloping drive uh, yard of the house at 22 Plymouth Street. So I don't think that this is um, a well-advised proposal and I too would like to object. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Betsy Block. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Andrew Pockrose, Betsy's husband. Uh, we have lived here for 26 years 22 Plymouth Street. at 22 Plymouth Street the next door property. Yes. And I'm a uh, real estate appraiser for the past 35 years in the area. And a couple of major points we would like to make are we think it's a very unfortunate idea. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Um, there would be a significant um, reduction of our privacy thus this driveway running literally on the lot line of the property there is no possible way to put an adequate buffer zone between this proposed driveway and our property as, as noted on that original plot plan the 9.9 .9 feet is just inadequate and that 9.9 .9 feet does not consider those two large trees that are directly in that bay area. Those trees are 100% alive. We've lived here, we've had to deal with those trees. There is no way that those are uh, dead trees at all. So I think there will be a significant reduction in our privacy and the appeal of our property and the marketability should we ever want to sell that property because the driveway would be literally looming right over our whole patio area. And um, it's just, 
it just wouldn't be aesthetically pleasing or particularly functional. Um, I, I would also like to talk about the stone wall for a minute. Yes. So for the first 10, we've lived here for 26 years. For the first 10 years we lived here, the former owners had told us that we owned that stone wall plus six inches over into what is obviously not our property, but we were told it was so that we would have to pay for the removal of an actual dead tree, which we did. Then at that 10 year mark, we got um, it, the land surveyed and that told us that we owned half of the stone wall. So the fact that we're being told right now that we own none of the stone wall is first of all news to us, shocking news after 26 years. And second of all, that's a historic stone wall from when this land used to be farmland. And we would be heartbroken to lose that stone wall. We feel very attached to it and feel it is a piece of history. When you started the meeting, sir, you talked about the history of this land and we very much feel that on our small but mighty property. <laughs> um, and just a couple other things. I would just note that it, there is no hardship to 16, 18 that they need this second driveway. As everyone's already pointed out, no one has a second driveway. They already have an existing two car garage they could more than adequately park four cars on that side of the property. There's just no, mm -hmm. there's no need for it and there's no precedent for it. Um, and as people have already pointed out, an extra driveway, right. children on the street, extra hazards. And the notion of moving the fire hydrant is also mm -hmm. uh, suspicious or whatever you wanna to say to us, um, moving it towards our property. Again, there's a very large tree there and we already have a fire hydrant on the other side of our property so adding a second one directly in front of our property again i don't think is um a Makes well sense for the street yeah it's not and it's just not a well thought out plan so um but primarily i'm concerned about our privacy the utility of our property and drainage and as well as the drainage notion um that I just don't think uh, the space is simply inadequate uh, in size to accommodate all of these notions. And there's, again, in no possible way to put an adequate buffer zone of any kind of vegetation because the stone wall is, the, is that space. And those two very large trees, uh, I would be shocked if the tree warden would allow those to be touched in any, in any way. They're, they're, they're quite large and quite healthy. So the last thing I would like to add is um, we built a patio. We completely landscaped our yard after having lived here for um, more than 20 years. We finally landscaped our yard and put in a beautiful patio. And this would completely encroach on that space that we waited for two decades to you know, install, pay, saved up, paid for, install. And we enjoy it tremendously. And that would definitely be ruined, to be honest. So we, we object to the, mm -hmm. the notion of Strongly. a second driveway. Can you tell me what the height of that wall is approximately? The height of the wall from our uh, side yeah. of the property? From your side. No, no. I would say like three feet. At what? But it depends on which part of our lot, because it mm -hmm. it's less at the near the street, and then it is probably for toward the back of our property, toward our neighbor's house. Okay, so between two and four feet, you know, from front to back. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment on this hearing um, and come back to the board. So, um, but we have in front of us uh, is, this, is a request for a second driveway. Um, a second driveway is allowed under Arlington zoning bylaw so long as there are certain findings that are made by the, uh, by the zoning board of appeals in regards to that request. Um, 
<clears throat> so there's the standard findings that the board needs to make uh, for any special permit. Uh, so is the requested use allowed? Is the requested use essential or desirable to public convenience and welfare? Uh, why the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety? Why the requested use will not overload any public system? Why the requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood? Why the requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare? And why the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood? And then um, specific to the location of parking spaces, the board would need to find that the second driveway may be added in a manner that avoids an undue concentration of population, that the second driveway may be added in a manner that allows adequate provision of transportation, and that the second driveway may be added in a manner that conserves the value of land and buildings in the vicinity. So those are the questions that are before the board. Um, the board did receive uh, late today um, a memorandum from the, um, from the Department of Planning and Community Development. I apologize, that came in uh, at 5.30 this afternoon. Um, I have not had a chance to look at it as of yet. Um, it'll open. Uh, let's, let's see if I can share this. Um, So hopefully um, you are seeing a letter from the town of Arlington. Um, so the applicant is seeking a second driveway. The property is currently being remodeled. The property is in the R2 district, conforming the bylaw lot size frontage. Uh, other requirements. The proposal would convert the rear yard to approximately 2234 square feet of green open space. It's usable space in the property. Lot coverage would decrease 26.8 to 22 under the proposal, would not increase the existing non conformity zone structure. Um, is a permitted use. It would provide a second driveway, create two parking. It's unclear whether adding a second curb cut along Plymouth Street would present a hazard to pedestrian, bicycle, or vehicular safety. The relocation of the fire hydrant <clears throat> would be required. Um, unclear whether adding a second curb cut along Plymouth Street would present a hazard for pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular safety. Uh, it would not create a burden on municipal systems. The special regulation is the specific questions on the parking spaces. Um, Staff note, there's an existing tree in the right side yard where the driveway is proposed. The applicant may need to receive approval of the tree plan, which we've mentioned. Uh, no other property on Plymouth has two curb cuts or two driveways, although lot coverage would decrease under the proposal, including a second driveway condition, where much of the front yard of the property would be paved, which is discouraged for aesthetic reasons. Based on the drawings and dimensional details provided by the applicant, the staff is unable to evaluate whether the proposal for a second driveway conforms with the requirements of the zoning bylaw. It's unclear whether the proposed design would detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or the adjoining districts. And the, number seven, the proposal would not cause any detrimental excesses. Staff note, however, the applicant's claim that two driveways equals less shuffling of cars, hence more pedestrian safety, runs counter to the modern planning understanding of the impact of increasing the supply of off-street parking. Um, and then there's just an uh, image of the, from up above. A couple of pictures from the streets. You can see the driveway. You can see the number of trees here. Here's one of the adjacent street trees. And then this is the lowered area um, that the, the last speaker had mentioned. Um, it's the corner of their yard down below here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the Department of Planning and Community Development maintains the proposal is consistent with the permit special permit criteria that re recommends the zoning board request revised drawings and plans showing location dimensions of the proposed parking area and curb cut in compliance with the dimensional vegetative buffer requirements. 
And I know the current structure meets the minimum number of parking spots required by the zoning bylaw recommends the applicant consider reconfiguring the existing parking area to provide more convenient access instead. Um, so this is the a letter prepared by the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development, which they do for all special permit applications. Um, so one thing to note is that uh, for two family dwellings, in the town of Arlington, the, the minimum required number of parking spaces is two. Um, and so the applicant could very easily, the, the applicant is looking to provide twice what the minimum required parking is. Um, and has been mentioned by several people, including the, the recent memo that it would involve a significant amount of pavement at the front of the house, um, uh, greatly reducing the amount of the front yard, impacting the side yards and impacting the um the the vegetation on that right hand side um i would like to ask the applicant um really what the what the reason is for wanting to have a second driveway is it merely for the convenience of those living at the property um or is there some other specific reason for needing to have um a second driveway okay so not only is it going to be convenient for that second driveway, but it realistically is for that open back space in the in the backyard. Yes, the garage would have been coming down, but we would still be paving that whole entire backyard. So realistically, we do not have, we really only have about a 15 by 20 foot backyard space where we would, where with what we're proposing, we have about 50 by 42. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just what I, and I wondered if you could simply ask the applicant whether the reduction in the pavement that he's talking about, the large amount of pavement in the back, is for the number of parking spaces that is currently proposed or whether, which I gather is more than the zoning bylaw requires, or is it to simply comply with the, with the, with the zoning? In other words, is, is, is this all due to the fact of, is, is, to what extent is that decrease in the amount of landscape space in the back due to over parking the house by measured by the boat zoning bylaw requirement. So as of right now, we still would have four spots um, in the in the back of the house. We've in per se because of the way that they would have to clear the house in order to drive past um, for each unit side by side. Hamlin, does that answer your question? I think. I think. I mean, I, what I'm what I'm hearing is is that it doesn't change from the what is proposed now. Is that correct? Yes. We would still have four spots mm -hmm. prior to this proposal, or if we get these proposed plans. Yeah, was was the removal of the um, garage, a requirement for any building permits or no? They were. It was, okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair? Hi, so we... Um, Yes, was that Mr. LeBlanc? Yeah. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, just uh, one question. I'm just looking through the special permit application, and there's differences in the existing and proposed uh, areas. And I'm just curious why there's a difference if this special permit is just for uh, driveway. 
because also the site plan that's provided in the application doesn't show any differences in building footprint? The footprint is, so the proposed drawings show the footprint as to what we extended through the building department um, without having to pursue a special permit and being within the bylaws as to what Arlington gives for the additional 725 square foot uh, square feet through the building department. So the proposed drawing does show the extension off the bat that we did extend eight feet for the property. That's why the garage is removed. There are there further questions from the board? Well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? That the, the early one was attempt to just follow up and understand better what the answer was to your question. But I guess I'd just like to focus on the, the three conditions that the three criteria that we have to find in order to allow this. And the way the zoning bylaw is stated is that if in order to be able to grant the extra driveway, we have to make a positive finding that the development is going to meet each of these criteria. And I think that undue concentration of population is probably not a matter of great concern. But the other two, adequate provision of transportation and conservation of the value of land and buildings, um, have been very much put in question by uh, the hearing. And on the basis of the record before us, at the best I can say is that I'm highly uncertain, either that uh, it's possible with the best will in the world to preserve the uh, trees that we have there. And I am not at this point able to make a positive finding that they are actually dead. Um, and I certainly, so there's the whole, that whole part, which all ultimately goes to the question of preserving the land, preserving the value of the lands nearby and so on, as well as other matters in the, in the section 3.3, um, is something that I don't think we could make a finding on. There's just too much uncertainty. Uh, I'd like to have the tree warden have already seen something and weigh in on whether this is really possible to do. I'd like to hear more about moving the fire hydrant and whether the environmental aspects of that have added were considered as opposed to just the water aspects. Um, all of those things are things that we need to know more about in order to make a positive finding. And with respect to the transportation, the staff has already indicated that they don't have enough information to advise us as to what kind of a positive finding to make. There have been some discussions about the uh, about children playing in the street, uh, the absence of this sort of thing in any of the other houses and so on, all of which to some extent go to the question as to whether or not there would be some sort of an impairment of transportation. So I feel less strongly about that because there's been less said about it and and much of it has been speculative, but it's very difficult at this point if we have a duty to make an affirmative finding that there won't be any interference with transportation. It's, it's very difficult to look at what's in this record and find and see what it is that such a finding could be based on. So that gives rise to a whole, there's a whole bunch of uncertainty that's expressed <laughs> in there. It's sort of a question, and I, and I doubt that it's possible for anybody to answer these questions off the cuff. We, we really need to have people weighing in from the town. We need to have real consult consultations with the tree warden. Uh, and maybe, I mean, all, all of us, I'm sure, most of us have gone out to look at this property. And I certainly agree with, with Mr. DuPont that when you look at this space and you look at those trees, and you look at the wall, it's very difficult to see how you could do what it is the applicant would like to do. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mr. DuPont. So I think, um, you know, I'd agree with what Mr. Hanlon has just said. And I think that the uh, neighbors have been pretty comprehensive and covering all of the concerns that anybody might have. I would just uh, point out, and I'm not sure anyone has said this today, but when I drove over there, it was it was pretty obvious that that is 
it's sort of a congested and short street. I don't know what the actual width is, but directly across from where that proposed driveway is, and this puts maybe a fine point on it, there's actually a sign on a tree that says caution children. And I know from having my kids attend the high school for eight years, uh, you know, from one to the the beginning of one to the end of the second, that that's kind of a major cut through from Highland Avenue for kids going to school. And I think we've had the same discussion with a property where they were looking at the bottom of Highland Avenue to put a driveway in. Um, based upon a variance request at that time. But the, I think that the concerns are the same. You've got a lot of kids walking together, talking, not necessarily paying attention. And to me, you know, this is not a place where somebody might expect to see a car coming from just based on the configuration that people have already noted, having one driveway per property. And I'm just concerned about the sight lines, the inattention, and just the congestion in general if people are parking that you just can't see very well. So that's one of my main concerns is kids going back and forth. Just wanted to add that. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, I, you know, just reading the, the memo from um, the planning department, uh, they, uh, one concern they bring up is, uh, you know, what the impact is to the neighborhood and to the character of the neighborhood. And, you know, I live in East Arlington uh, with a similar configuration of houses with driveways on one side. And, and uh, sort of all the green space on the street is uh, the front yards that are between the driveways. And though I don't think that one house would change the streetscape so much. Uh, if if one neighbor uh, chose to do this, and then all the neighbors chose to do this, we'd have a lot of paved front yards um, along a street, which I, I do think does have a big impact on the sort of character of the neighborhood and how the street feels. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to sort of add my two cents on that. Well, thank you. Okay. Anything further from the board? So based um, on the, oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry. Uh, I guess I just kind of wanted to go off a couple of points from Mr. DuPont on um, some of his observations. Uh, also going back to the, the applicant saying that the driveway is intended to slope uh, downward to go along the, the sloping line of the adjacent property. Um, thinking about you know backing out of a, a slope driveway and sight lines when you're backing out of that um, is more difficult. Um, you know, I have a flat driveway and I still have trouble um, pulling out. Um, so there, there's that, and also just kind of thinking about this a little bit further too with the sloping. Uh, just worried about the foundation of the actual building um, without really too much more knowledge or understanding of how much that grade change is um, based off of the information we're provided in the application. Uh, it's not sufficient enough for us to to understand that to make a, a finding. Thank you. So, um, so there are several comments that there, there are you know, a lot of questions that we have um, <laughs> that on the application that you know, sort of would prevent us from uh, being able to make the required findings. Um, and it's not clear uh, that, you know, clarifying those questions, whether, you know, once those questions are clarified, whether or not we would be able to make the findings or not is also a question. Um, so I would, so I think the, the, the first question the board needs to decide is, do we feel that we want to, um, Request that the applicant come back before us with additional information, or does the board feel that it has sufficient information in order to to render a decision? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont. So, uh, based upon the comments that Mr. Hanlon made about the information that we don't have necessarily with regard to the tree warden and such. 
I tend to think that it may be up to the applicant to decide whether or not he would like to come back um, as much as it is whether we feel like we have enough information. I don't feel personally like I have enough information, but I do think it's the prerogative of the applicant to say that he would like to uh, obtain the information that's been referenced and come back or to just go forward. So I would probably think that we were going to withdraw our special permit application just because we really want our neighbors to be happy. Um, our intention is to make this look as aesthetically pleasing as possible, but with all of the setbacks that we've been receiving from our neighbors, I think we're going to just withdraw our application altogether. Um, would you like us to, to vote to accept that withdrawal this evening? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so then the uh, the applicant has requested that uh, they be allowed to, to withdraw their application. Um, and so the this would, as we've done on the, the prior two cases, this would be a, require a vote of the board. So um, I move that the board um, accept the request to withdraw on behalf of the applicant for 1618 Plymouth Street. Um, is without prejudice. Second. Um, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. Uh, so then a vote. So this is. Uh, then a roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Rigardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, so the special permit application for 1618 Plymouth Street has been withdrawn without prejudice. Uh, our thanks to the applicant, our thanks to the neighbors uh, for being present this evening. Thank you. Thank you all so, so much. Brings us let's see, back to our agenda tonight. Brings us to uh, item number five, which is docket 3735106 Mount Vernon Street. Um, so if I could ask the applicant to introduce themselves and tell us what they are proposing. And um, just a question for the applicant if they have information to share or if I should share the application, the um, the application. Thank you. I'll introduce, um, we won't all speak. Um, I'll briefly introduce ourselves and then our architect, um, Jenna, is on the line. Oh, perfect. Awesome. So she'll be sharing and um, speaking on our behalf. Um, I just want to briefly thank everyone for this opportunity. We're grateful to live in a community where we can have public face-to-face -face discussions, make decisions as a community. Um, it's what we find to be really special about Arlington and we're grateful. We've lived here for the past 12 years. Uh, we actually lived in a condo across the street from our current home where we quickly established relationships and inevitably several years ago um, purchased privately from a neighbor here um, by way of some much beloved neighbors that are essentially our surrogate parents. Um, today, we have a six-year-old son and an eight-year-old daughter at Brackett. I get to be a room parent. My husband coaches soccer. We spent last Saturday at Town Hall celebrating Arlington Eats. Um, during the day, we've built careers centered in social support, arts, and education. Um, my husband worked at ACMI for several years, which is how we became acquainted with the community. We fell in love with Mount Vernon and this neighborhood because it embodies the idyllic neighborhood that my husband grew up in and the one I longed for as a child myself. Um, working together with our neighbors and community we allow um, access to our driveway to cut trees. We drop off flowers when there's broken wrists. We help with snow shoveling. Um, we hosted a fundraiser for a neighbor up the street who kicked ass at the PMC last summer. Um, we even hosted an apple cider party for neighbors with a small driveway because we love them and their boys truly like our own. Um, my mom is no stranger to the neighborhood as well. I have no siblings, and for many years it was just my mom and me, and boy did she work hard so I could grow up and be the adult that I am. 
Simply put, married or not, my mother, now 74 years old and feeling her age, is my person, and I'm lucky to be married to someone who feels the same responsibility to our aging parents that I do. I want to care for her, and I know the benefits of intergenerational housing, so, and we support economic and social mobility, and we love that we live in a town like Arlington that supports ADUs. My children thrive having my mother, and some on this call can remember my mom slowly walking up and down Mount Vernon with a newborn, followed by a newborn and a toddler, to two children, often with neighborhood friends in tow. When my mother decided to sell her home during the pandemic, a neighbor a few streets over graciously opened up her home for her to live temporarily, and we have another neighbor on Mount Vernon that will be housing her while they're away this summer. This type of generosity rarely exists, and we're so grateful. Our family unit allows us to be fulfilled, and the pandemic, along with housing shortages and known scarcity, have only propelled this decision. During this unique-to-us experience over the past day, We've thought a lot about the values we want to embody as a family and bring to this experience, as construction is not easy for anyone. And we've decided our actions and behaviors will continue to be rooted in what we believe in, community, character, care, communication, and an open door policy. Life is short and we're grateful we can make things work. Um, we're grateful for everyone in our neighborhood, everyone, because they teach us how to be better every day. Our architect, Jenna, is on the line. Um, we are requesting an ADU. Um, our rear yard now is a full story below our existing first level. The new deck that we propose in our yard will create more usable space off the main level. Um, the location of the garage in the back left corner still leaves space around for a neighborhood buffer. Um, the driveway length currently fits three cars and we would have a new garage space. And we plan to use the space above and below the deck responsibly and in the ethos of a good neighbor. So I am not an architect or an assessor, so I'm going to leave it to Jenna to ask questions. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, Jenna, do you need access to, uh, to display? Hello. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's Colleen. If you for... could make Jenna Ellison a co host, I don't see her on my list. I don't know. Where... Um, I have her on my list. She's my participant list. She's the third name right after you and I. You could share your screen if you wanted to just go through the plans. Oh, you're all set now. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenna Ellison. Um, I work for Pegasus Design to Build. Um, I'm a licensed architect in the state of Massachusetts, um, and I work with a general contractor. So Pegasus sort of does it all. Um, so we will be, you know, we've been working with um, the Snyders now for about six months doing the design and getting everything ready to present to you guys. Um, so I will share my screen here and walk you through the design. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, please let me know. Um, so a few 3D images here of um, their existing house and the proposed addition. Um, so as Bailey stated, um, there's a pretty um, big grade change from the front of the house to the back of the house. Um, and they have a walkout basement currently. Um, so our proposed addition um, has a first floor garage with um, a sort of hidden entry door um, to go up to the ADU. And then um, we're connecting the two structures by a shared deck. Um, and right now they have to go out the side door and down their driveway to use their backyard. So this will help them substantially be able to enjoy their outdoor space um, as well as um, have their mom on the same level as them so that she doesn't have to walk up and down stairs to see the kids and to, you know, participate in family activities. Um, so as you can see here, this is sort of their existing driveway. Um, I will show you the cert or the um, sort of uh, site plan here, which I think uh, depicts it pretty well. So their driveway ends at the edge of their house right now. Um, so to keep 
um, the ability to have three cars in the driveway and still be able to walk to their backyard. Basically, we have um, a, a distance here of a little over um, five and a half feet. Um, so um, friends can come down the driveway and still, you know, hang out in the backyard without having to have a weird way around the house or anything like that. Um, and then this has a little overhang here and um, their mom would be able to go up upstairs to her space. Um, so the two things that we are asking for um, relief on are um, the side yard setback and the rear yard setback. Um, because we're attaching these two with the deck, essentially we have to use um, the house setbacks versus having a detached garage where we could have, except, you know, use the accessory setbacks. And, um, you know, just from understanding how they live and, you know, how in the next 20 years, Martha's going to be, you know, needing to get back and forth. I, we think it's very important to have the connection of the structures. And that's sort of where this sort of whole design came from, that there's a shared space for them and their community to still be able to come to their yard, as well as Martha having a little bit of her own privacy and her own space um, and keeping with, you know, the same context of a traditional style home, um, you know, with a gable roof um, and a, a pretty modest footprint here. So they have a, a nice size garage on the first floor where they can store their outdoor things, um, her stairway up. Um, so there would be four parking spaces, one would be in the garage. Um, so potentially, you know, a hidden car and then two in the driveway um, would give some flexibility there. Um, and then Martha's space, which is on um, the first floor level, which she can access from the street um, and then walk through if, say, you know, the stairs got too much for her or anything like that, um, is at the same level as um, the main home. And she has, you know, a closet, a modest bathroom and an open living space um, with her kitchenette and um, uh, washer dryer there. So she has a little bit of her own deck space. The family has their deck space there. Um, and a few other things to note, um, you know, if we go by like average height of the grade, um, you know, we could potentially, you know, um, it, it basically uh, what I'm thinking is if, if anything um, needs to be discussed with the um, neighbors, they're open to, you know, modifying any roof lines to, to help or, um, you know, modifying the deck if, any dimensions feel like they could be tweaked. Um, we're very open to um, suggestions and, and everyone wants, you know, to live happily here and not cause any turmoil. So, um, you know, this is ideal for us um, and, and we would really like it attached, but we could potentially go the detached route if, you know, that needs to, to, to happen. Um, so hopefully, you know, I've explained enough and I can show more photos or anything like that if um, that will help with any questions. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, so just for the, the general public, though, there's essentially there are two applications that are being put forward um, for this property. Uh, one is a special permit um, for some of the, some of the, um, uh, some, some of what they need, but they also are requesting a variance. And so a variance under Massachusetts law is a very specific request. Um, it, it, the criteria for it are set under state law, not under local bylaw. And they are essentially, it is a request for a specific exemption from the local zoning code um, due to specific uh, criteria, which are established under state law. So um, the board will be discussing both of these um, slightly both of these aspects of it slightly differently. So um, just for the for general circumstances, that's that's sort of the way that that will happen. Um, so the first question I had had. Um, so the currently the house um, the setback that's on the rear setback and with the left side setback, the house is currently compliant with both of those. Is that correct? Um, say that again, the left side setback. Yes. The, the rear, existing rear home is. setback. Yep. Those are, yeah. 
um, obviously, and then the right side is non-conforming at seven feet. Correct. Yep. So this um, is um, <clears throat> the survey here. So okay. Um, that's correct. Yep. So we would need a ten-foot side yard um, for you know the the house, um, and we're proposing a six-foot here, and we would need um, a nineteen-foot rear, and we're proposing a little bit over nine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then um, here, the uncovered deck, I believe, can be five feet from the property line by right. Um, so I believe that Half this distance, one, yeah. yeah, is closer, but um, should be you know uh, okay with the uncovered deck. Okay. And then, does the property currently have the required usable open space? So that is what um, we're going for <clears throat> the variance for. Yeah. So, um, and also potentially could clarify this for me because I know in the bylaws it states to um, that it would need 25 by 25 for the usable open space, 25 feet by 25 feet. Um, yeah. And right now we are proposing um, 19 feet by 27 feet. Um, mm -hmm. And we can probably get there by removing deck, like I said. Um, so that's sort of open for determination. And then I know in the bylaw, it also states for new construction that it could be 20 by 20. So I wasn't sure if with this addition, if that's considered the new construction or because it's existing home, if it would be the 25 by 25. So, um, yeah. so, so this would be an alteration. So okay. it would still be... 25 being the minimum dimension. Um, okay. So, yeah. Yep. So, so that was the variance home. application. Right. So there's there's really three things you're seeking in the variance. One is the usable open space. Um, and then the other is related to the, the, pro the proposed ADU, the reduction in the side yard setback and the reduction in the rear yard setback. Correct. That's all three. Okay. Um, have you had any... So you're proposing to uh, increase the impervious nature of the site. Have you pursued anything in regards to uh, to the stormwater retention or how that would be handled? Yep. So um, our foundation subcontractor um, is proposing to put a dry well in. Um, so essentially, we would, you know, retain any water that's um, coming off the roof on site, and that would be designed. Um, and submitted with the building permit with the structural design and everything, um, basically to be sufficient with the town's guidelines. Okay. Um, I think those are the questions I have at the moment. Um, other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, you may have to forgive me. I had to take a minute away from the screen and I probably missed the, the, the an important question. Um, I was, I've been sort of trying to figure out whether or not the, and, and if so, for what a variance is actually needed. Um, it's my understanding that we just sort of breaking it down, if this were just a garage, it could be placed up to what, six feet away from the property line and with the special exception, uh, more mm -hmm. than that, as long as it was built with a certain amount. And under the zoning bylaw, if they had a garage and then you added an ADU to it, um, if it was, an, uh, if it was uh, not attached, uh, then you could still do the same thing by right, not by asking our mm -hmm. permission by right. It looks to me as if none of the none of the borders here, um, the setbacks uh, reach all the way to six feet. So that would not be a problem either. Um, so the question then comes down to whether or not the the deck makes a difference, and the. Uh, I know that it is the practice in Arlington to uh, treat a deck that combine that connects two buildings as if it makes them attached. Uh, notice that the zoning bylaw itself in the ADU provision doesn't talk about what is detached. It talks about what is attached. And there is a definition for uh, 
attached to building in the uh, in section two, which says that to be attached, a building has to have a common wall with another building. A common wall with another building. Mm -hmm. Now, detached is, you would think, would be the opposite, but there the definition is that it's detached if it has no physical connection with another building. But the ADU ordinance doesn't talk about detached. It only uses the concept attached. And that in turn is has to do with a common wall. And I don't see how the deck here creates a common law, wall. So I'm not 100% certain in my own mind that under the strict language of the zoning bylaw that there actually is something that needs a variance, or at least for these two things. Uh, and I want to pause here and ask Ms. Ellison if she agrees with that. Um, so it's interesting that you say that because we, at one point we did have an attached um, like common mudroom. Um, and then we, you know, sort of actually reduced things and um, made the footprint a bit smaller. Um, so that's interesting that you bring up the, the shared wall. Um, I, I'm... I'm, I think it's up for interpretation of how, how you say that. I think in my head when, you know, I'm attaching it with the deck, it it acts as one. Um, so that was sort of how I'm, I've am i been envisioning it. But um, yeah, there is no wall. So <laughs> uh, there's I railing. Will, <laughs> I will say that I, I, I've, I've talked to ISD about this. Their practice is to treat this as if it makes an attachment. But, you know, we're dealing with a new statute here. Uh, one that was very strongly supported by town meeting and it went a long way towards creating a sort of a new public purpose in the zoning bylaw that we have to consider. And so I just want to pay, put that as a question because as we go through the factors on the variance, I want to at least have in the back of our minds that we may want to have reserved for ourselves the question whether or not uh, the variance is needed. Now there's still one other thing and that's the usable open space. And I can't, my eyes are even, uh, are, are 77 years old and I can't see this very well, but what I'm trying to figure out, the proposed deck itself is usable open space, correct? Uh, at least ISD informs me that it is and that the stair up to it shouldn't, disrupt the discontinuity the bit of the portion there that is potentially usable open space is slanted on one side and it's a little hard to see whether there's a 25 foot square there and so i would like if miss ellison to say if 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 the only question at this point is whether there's the minimum dimension of 25 feet i haven't gotten to the question about whether if there is there's enough um, but I can't see whether whether the 25 foot square is there and I wonder if she could inform me about that. Good question. Um, I have um, this in a software that I can do the measurement. I was under the impression that um, the land, the usable open space had to be on the same level and that the deck covering would not count as that. But if it is, the deck area um, could count then, because um, really this was the, the smallest dimension here. Um, I believe if I could use this deck area that we could probably get it. <laughs> okay, I, I did get a sense from, and we might want to confirm this because I didn't ask specifically about being on the same level or not. Okay. Uh, but in general, a, a deck does count as usable open space and that, that could affect the, your need to get a variance on that part uh, on that part uh, as well. I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay. Obviously, if we're in a situation where you currently comply with the bylaw and you've introduced a new nonconformity, that's something that we have a hard time dealing with by special permit. But the facts here seem to me to be squishy enough in terms of how to, to analyze all of this that I th I'd like us to at least everybody who's paying attention to this to keep to keep this this in mind. By the way, you know, it just it, it, the amazing thing is is that if it turns out that the 25 foot square will go from zero to 625 feet in a heartbeat because mm -hmm. it's really a, a, a an accident of 
it's not when when you say there's zero open space it doesn't mean there's no open space it just means that there's a there's a very technical requirement for us under the zoning bylaw that causes a discontinuity there mm -hmm. Mr. chairman those are the questions i have thank you mr hamlin i think it is a, it is a very interesting question about you know including deck areas um in most cases where that has come before the board in the past the deck is typically much closer to the ground level and doesn't have an open area that is a full height underneath it um and the criteria for usable open space does require that the majority of it be open to the sky um and so i'm kind of curious on the how the the zoning enforcement officer would interpret it if it would include space under the deck or if it would include space over the deck in a situation like this. Um, my understanding is that the, you know, inspectional services has determined that, um, you know, to the, to the question about whether these are attached or not, I think the spectral services has made their determination that it, it is considered um, attached and therefore we're, um, we are tasked with with treating it as such, um, but it it is a little odd that if you just remove the deck, then it becomes you know obviously then it's no longer attached. It's a very different uh, set of criteria. Um, are there other questions from the board, Mr. Chair, Mr. Holly? Um, this project reminds me of another ADU we had probably sometime last year. Um, the one question I had is, um, there's windows on the left elevation and, um, with, with the property line being so close, um, I'm not even looking at the views at this time. If it were a garage, there would be a different type of construction, but with the, with an, you know, with a bedroom and a living space above, this still is a type five, a construction based on the based on the chart that was provided. So there is a limitation on the window, um, the amount of fenestration there because of the proximity. Um, is that something, um, Ms. Allison, have any information on that aspect? Um, so I believe if it's closer than five feet that we would need to do the um, special type of construction or the, what is it, type? Type of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think that we were <clears throat> like giving us us being at the six feet would mean that we would not have to. Um, I thought it was 10 feet, but again, I we could um, maybe you'll have to look into that. Yeah, I believe it's closer than five, but I could be wrong. So for a, for an unlimited, but there is a percentage even for a 10 feet under 10 feet for an unlimited. You're right that more than 10 feet. But if you're. Um, if you're under 10 feet, there is a still a 25% limit. So okay. Um, right. Possibly yeah. it would I can do that calculation. Look into that. Yep. Figure that out. No problem. Right. Because I um again based on my recollection, it, they they changed the um type of construction that would allow, I guess, you know, with zero lot line or closer to FSD. But this okay. being still a five way might trigger that. Okay. I'll double check that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Oh, Mr. DuPont? Um, so I, I would just start out by saying that I think that when we're looking at this new bylaw, the accessory dwelling unit, it doesn't necessarily mesh with other provisions that we have to take into account. And so I think it does make it difficult for us in terms of whether we are dealing with a variance uh, versus not. And I I believe, you know, I think I'd start out if I was looking at 5.9.2 in terms of the requirements, I think we can at least agree that it's not a large addition, right? Because it's not 750 right. square feet or more. So that sort of brings me down then to the last bullet point on that particular page where it says requirements. And it starts out saying an accessory dwelling unit may be located, et cetera. But then it says, um, uh, 
if there is an accessory building, if I'm reading this correctly, uh, it if if provided that if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line then such accessory dwelling shall be allowed only if we make a finding according to section 3.3. And then it outlines those things that we need to determine, including whether it's substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood um, than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. So I realized that there's some discussion about, well, if it was just a garage, then the requirements for the side and the rear yard setback would be much different. But right now we're sort of looking at this in terms of an accessory, um, an accessory or a building. And so for me, the character of it is a little bit different if it's an accessory building that is not within the six feet of the lot line. Um, the, the other consideration is that as I read this new portion of the bylaw, if somebody does say put in a, a garage and then determines after that's constructed that they want to now convert it and to add some accessory uh, dwelling unit space, we still are faced with this making the determination if it's within six feet of the lot line as to whether or not it's more detrimental, et cetera. So it, it feels a little bit circular to me. So I, I think that the um, email from, uh, you know, from community uh, development, you know, planning department, I think that, you know, they suggested that there was a, should be a conversation with the building department as to whether or not as a right, they can do something there. And that, I guess, even if they said, yes, you can, you can build your garage next to the lot line, that still has to come back to us, I think, for the determination for the special permit. So I just mm -hmm. think it gets a little bit jumbled. That's all I'm saying. And I think we end up having to make that determination regardless of Mr. whether Sh there's a variance. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, my understanding is that this isn't within six feet. So that the proviso that's here, that it, it should be allowed only if, if you know, it, the proviso is if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line. And I think it's not, but I may be mistaken. Is, is Ellison can clarify that. It looks to me like the closest it gets is six feet. That's correct. But my question, if I may, is mm -hmm. then if if it's not within six feet, are we now having to talk about what the side yard setbacks have to be in order for it to conform? And I think that's a separate issue because then it gets into the question as to whether a variance is needed. I think so. I, I, I guess the question, if if you presumably you couldn't just build a separate building that was six feet away that had no other reason why it is that it could be be that close the the thing that was the thing that was true about the zone about the adu bylaw is that they wanted to be able to have people put adus by right into garages that already existed that was what they had in their head and so many times they are already within six feet. We're already up to six feet. So the way in which the, they made a compromise on that was instead of making it by right all the way to the property line, um, they stopped at the six foot, said you can do it by right if you don't go within six feet. Otherwise, you have to get a special permit from us. And what we have to ask is whether or not the ADU makes it more intrusive than just a garage would be because you could already do the garage. Right. And so I think that if you don't go within six feet, then it's not a special permit situation anymore. The proviso that's in that fifth bullet uh, of uh, uh, 5.92 um, is, is presumes that there's some other justification for getting closer than the regular setback to the uh, to the lot line, you couldn't, but but that would be true here. 
and there's no particular reason why you have to do this in two stages and build the first garage and then add the the ADU. So I think that 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 they can actually go by right if it's if this if if this is not treated as an attached uh, building. Uh, and if it is treated as an attached building, then they have to meet the normal requirements of the bylaw that they don't have a basis for going any closer than than the 10 feet that otherwise is required. So to follow on that point, then, is this being characterized in the description you just gave, Mr. Hanlon, as a garage, which could be built in the location that is... It is. It is both. It is both. It is a garage with a with a ADU on top of it. A rather small ADU, actually. But it's, it's only two thirds the maximum size of an ADU. Uh, but it's a combined structure, and it's just exactly. I mean, it's exactly that structure. This is sort of the opposite side of. If you remember the Venner Road case that I think Mr. Holy, it was exactly the other way around. They wanted to go close and wanted to but also wanted to, to be attached and they eventually gave up on having the a separate building and, and brought it back to where they wanted to be because they couldn't get closer that way so if i may again if that's the case and this structure could be built as a garage slash adu we're still having to answer the question are we not about the usable open space Yes, yes. If there's, if in fact, it seems to me that if in fact you're dealing with a situation where we are now in compliance and there's a new nonconformity, because if there is some usable open space, there's not enough, or if we decide that there's not any because you don't meet the minimum requirements, then you have introduced that, and that would separately be a reason for a variance, I, is at least the way I look at it now. Anything further, Mr. DuPont? No, I would agree with what Mr. Hanlon just said. Okay. Mr. Riccadelli, I think you were speaking up earlier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was I was going down the same path that Mr. DuPont was going down, so I, I don't think I need to add much, but I do think that it sort of comes down to if, if the building department thinks that the deck comes this as one building, then um that that may be sort of an issue uh with that six foot setback from the side yard so thank you are there further questions or comments from the board at this time mr chair so this is not uh an a large addition because it's less than 750 is wow well, okay and not including the garage right um right because the garage does not count towards gross floor area yeah thank you mr Chair. I see nothing further from the board. In a moment, I will open up the hearing for public questions and comment. Um, so again, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or we have reached, oh, we are starting to get a little late, aren't we? Um, I try to go at least till 9.45. Um, 
Uh, public comment period will be closed, for, and we'll do our best to uh, display what things are being requested. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead. Um, a few hands up. So first is uh, Mary O'Connor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor, and I represent Edwin Schmidt and Gail Gulkazian, who own the property at 79 Situate Street, immediately behind the applicant's property, and Scott and Virginia Tower, who own the property at 110 Mount Vernon Street to the right of the property. Um, I, I will address the variance issue first. I, I respectfully suggest that a variance is required here. As the board knows, the building inspector is responsible for interpreting the bylaw. And I think the connected deck um, makes this a situation where a variance is required under 5.3.13b because the deck is an integral part. Oh, of the um, so you have that issue as well. I also think that a variance is required because um, of the FAR and uh, the use of open space issue. Uh, they're creating new uh, additional nonconformities. Uh, I also note that the lot coverage issue was not addressed in the application, and that would likewise raise an issue. Uh, if a variance is required, um, I've submitted a letter on behalf of my clients that lays out the law. Um, frankly, I would yeah. suggest yeah. that the applicants would not qualify for a variance. The standards for a variance are quite, uh, quite strict. There is nothing different about this particular lot than other lots in the neighborhood. It has to be something unique to this lot, soil, shape, or topography. And um, I, I understand I, I understand the issue of intergenerational living, but unfortunately, personal circumstances do not, as the board knows, constitute the type of hardship that is required to give a variance. Uh, so I, I would say that it is not likely um, that the board uh, could find a variance here. With respect to the special permit request, um, some of the conditions that the board has to find under 3.3.3 is that relief is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. This is a non-conforming lot that is going to be virtually entirely covered by building. Um, and you must also find that what's being proposed will not impair the character or integrity of the district. And I would suggest to you that um, this is too much massing, too much on this small undersized lot. Though the neighbors are sympathetic to the situation of this applicant, this is out of a character for the neighborhood. And um, my clients do have a, a presentation they'd like to show, uh, and they are opposed to the grant of both a special permit and variance here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Um, next on the list uh, is Galen White. I'm going to put the video on. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Galen White, and this is Kareem Mims. And um, we are the uh, direct neighbors next door. Um, if you're looking at uh, 106 Mount Vernon, we're to the left at 102 Mount Vernon. We have uh, been here for two years now um, and, and could not be more excited about this neighborhood. Um, we have been welcomed with open arms um, by everyone and in particular um, by Bailey and Sean and their entire family. Um, we wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight um, and just want to um, give our support and say um, how amazed and um, just impressed uh, with um, all that Bailey and Sean do for the neighborhood and for um, the families here and um, how welcoming and community oriented they are um, and how much of a huge part um, uh, Martha has played too in uh, their family and, and the life of their, their children and, and everyone here on the street. So we just want to give our support and, um, and say that um, we are behind you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next is uh, Megan Burns. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Megan Burns and this is Fred Hager. We live at 169 Mount, 169 Mount Vernon Street and we have lived on the street for 10 years. Um, we just want to comment that we are in support of uh, Bailey and Sean and Marty in their effort to have this proposed ADU. We think it's extraordinarily important to have some flexibility and understanding that intergenerational living is extremely important for both the families with the young children, as well as for the um, elder members of our community who are supporting our children. And I just wanna say that in a town like Arlington that is pro-family and is very supportive, we would like to see something like this um, in our neighborhood supporting um, people who are great community members. And I will just add a personal note to say that I met Marty before I met Martha, excuse me, um, for the record, um, before I met Sean and Bailey as she was caring for um, uh, Sean and Bailey's older child who is the same age as our child. And, um, and you know, I um, would love it if I could have my parents um, live close by in a similar manner because there's nothing more than having the support that you need and being able to use your property in um, a manner that makes sense for you and your family. So thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our list is Mr. Steve Moore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, as always, my particular focus is trees and from what I can tell, there are two very large trees at the back of this property on the fence line shared by uh, the neighbor, I believe, and uh, the applicants. Um, I don't know if any of this work, and from what I can tell, the answer is probably no, but I, I can't tell if any of the work is going to impinge on um, the root zone of those trees. So that'd be my first question to the applicant, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Elson, do you... Can you address that question? Um, I'm not positive on what. Um, so basically, there is one large tree that's um, in the fence line. Um, so essentially, we would be nine and a half feet away from that. So ideally, we were not planning on touching any of the trees um, and keeping it as is. And typically, they'll protect the side so that no one you know, runs anything into them. Um, but I would need to consult with um, an arborist to determine if the nine feet is enough to protect the, the root system. Thank you, Mr. Moore. But we were not planning on um, harming any trees or taking anything down. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, that, that's, uh, that's good news. And the, uh, the addition of a tree protection plan, or not plan, but just methods, uh, would be important because that looks like a substantial tree. And if, if it's, you know, it's basically a, a foot away from the tree for every inch of BBH and uh, it looks like a pretty big tree. So, uh, but, but it strikes me that a lot of this work isn't necessarily going to serve that. I don't know, just uh, something, something to keep in mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is Mark Kelly. Next on the list um, is Scott Tower. Um, my name is Scott Tower. Um, I don't have it. Um, my name is Scott Tower, and I am the, my wife and I, Ginger, and I are uh, right side of Butters to um, the property at 110 Mount Vernon Street. We've been here since. 1985, that's 38 years. Um, we also love the street in the neighborhood. And um, we have taken care of our property for, for all these 38 years. And um, we would like to state our opposition to the um, application or petition um, for the 106 ADU. Um, I believe that that addition negatively impacts us, our quality of life and our property values. Um, the 
lot sizes in our neighborhood are already um, less than non-conforming, um, less than 5,000 square feet. And if we were to be able to count the, the garage as, as space, um, it's almost like putting a house, almost two houses in a property that already can't handle one house. I mean, it's already not, it's only doesn't account for. So um, we are worried also about, you know, a lot of things, but the, you know, it sets a precedence um, where, you know, these lots are small and, and um, stuff. Um, it, um, we worry about, uh, well, on the left side of Butters, it's going to block sunlight because it's a two, two story addition. Um, in addition, um, an HVAC system was not, was not indicated in any of the drawings. If it's outside of the house, I don't know if it is, it's not a huge point, but an HVAC system, um, can indeed be very noisy and disruptive. Um, and I, I guess our biggest concern really is, um, is the deck. The deck is very big. Um, it's on a property that grades down. So the deck is six, 10 feet, six feet above, above grade. And as such, it can loom over the property in the rear and, and the noise and the lights and the activity that can occur there um, will will resonate to to our side, and it is also you know less than six feet from our property. And I know it's a deck, and that sort of supposedly doesn't apply, which I learned today. But it is awfully close to to our property and raised, and as such, um, you know, there's no way there's no way that we can essentially sort of have any privacy. Yeah, yeah, have any privacy from the the if there's any activity or anybody on the deck, we can't, there's nothing we can do as a butters to to block their their um, you know block them or have privacy in our own property. So um, those are sort of the key things. Um, other things are um, the indication that there is no effect on traffic. Um, it feels like, you know, that's a small driveway already. We all have narrow driveways, we understand that, but um, they're too detached, for all intents of purposes, detached officially, your terminology, I don't know, but, um, but those properties are not, uh, are, from my understanding, detached. And as such, managing cars, in two detached properties is not a simple thing, which means that, you know, there's gonna to have to be negotiation between these two detached properties to manage moving cars, which would to us probably mean that there'll be more on-street parking. Mount Vernon Street is not a wide street. There is a fire hydrant in front of their house. So that means they're going to park in front of neighboring properties. And the street is narrow enough so that if there is side-by-side -side parking, larger vehicles will not be able to pass. So I do believe um, that there is a, um, a traffic issue that can be imposed by this, by this property. Um, those are sort of like the main things. Um, hang on, let me make sure air I don't. Air pollution, air pollution, light pollution, noise pollution. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is a permanent structure, and what happens, you know, over time when it's not an in-law apartment, does that mean that it becomes a rental of property? I don't know how the, all that works, but um, then, 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 then it becomes also more difficult to manage cars. And then what happens to the deck with, you know, uh, if it's a rental property, are they buddies? Are they not buddies? It, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a permanent structure, which in, in, the, in the garage, which isn't counted, it, it just, it's just a really big structure in a small lot. 
with a big debt. And, and if they're considering that the area under the deck is, is open space, I don't know how that's all gonna work, but blocked by the deck and, and the, there's a garage, there's a back door from the basement to their backyard. And that's a three quarter, three quarter door, which implies to me that, that if there were a deck there, a normal heighted human being couldn't stand, stand at least at the, at the foundation end of that deck. So I, that, whole, that whole deck thing um, is bothersome to us. And um, as such, um, we, oppose, we oppose this addition. Oh yeah, yeah, and and you know they, they're good neighbors and all that. It's it's the permanent nature of the very large structure that uh, we find um, a little offense, find offensive and concerning. and concerning, and the deck as well. And I guess I guess that's that's it for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Tower. Um, uh, next is Edmund, Edwin Schmidt. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak. And um, we wonder if we could um, share uh, uh, um, some slides with you. Ralston, can we do that for them? You He's are all set. set. He's all set. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me let me get started, and uh, then we can share some slides. Um, my name is Gail Gulkasian, and I'm here with my husband Edwin Schmidt, who goes by Ned but on the official documents, he's Edwin. Um, we bought our house at 79 Situate Street in 1990 and have lived here for the last 33 years, uh, which is half our lives because we are also senior citizens. Um, we raised our children here and hope to remain here for as long as we're able to in our retirement. Um, our property abuts the rear of the applicant's property so that our backyards face each other. Excuse me a moment. Can you, can you all see the slides? Cannot. Hmm. At the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen, there should be a green button that says share screen. Yeah. Um, just you select that and then of the images that pop up, select the one you want. How about now? Unfortunately, no. Okay. All right. Hold on. There we go. All okay. right. Very good. We've, accomplished, All right. we've accomplished task one. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are the rear abutters to the applicant's property, and we submitted a written opposition which includes a lot of detail and goes over what we believe are specific uh, defects in the application materials. Those are mostly related to the legal points already highlighted by attorneys. So we are not gonna, you'll be happy to hear, I'm not gonna repeat those here, but it's in our document. But I mean, our general view is that the applications would overcrowd this small land and leave zero usable open space and really be devastating to abutters use and enjoyment of their own properties, at least, at least for us, and set a, a, a precedent for further overcrowding this, this neighborhood. Um, the applicants are not seeking, I mean, we've talked about this a bit already, they're not seeking um, exemptions from just one rule or, or one setback, but substantial relief sort of all over the place. And um, so we've highlighted what we believe um, are, are all the, the issues. I, mean, I, I admit that my understanding was that because 
all these uh, buildings and decks would be attached, that the setbacks applied to all of them. And I know that that's up for debate, but um, basically it's as close as, you know, five feet, eight inches, the deck is to the, the side property line. And for us, the, the uh, building, the, the new proposed building would be 14 feet um, rather than 19 feet, which is the setback area um, from, the, from the rear property line. I'm sorry, it would be 9.9 .9 feet. So um, about half of the, the required setback. So we're not talking about a small amount, we're talking about a substantial change. And I, I wanna note that we, we are not really comfortable being here to oppose something our neighbors want for themselves. And we certainly take nothing away from all the good things that Bailey and Sean and, and, and Marty, I don't, I hope I can call her Marty, um, that um, do for the neighborhood and how well liked they are by the neighbors and all that. And this is absolutely nothing personal and not to detract from any of that. This is about the, you know, our property and our ability to enjoy the property and, and the neighborhood that, that we've lived in for the past 33 years. So I, I just want to be perfectly clear that that we're we're basically we feel we're advocating for ourselves, our property, and and the neighborhood um, and property values and property values as well. That's right. Um, and and I also I think it's been noted, but I'm going to note again that many people in the neighborhood, including us, have added to their house to to gain additional living space, but have done so without violating the zoning rules. And, and without intruding on the interests of the, the people that live around them. I mean, we are very, very close to each other. Um, and this shows how, how this slide that we show now shows how much of the lot will be consumed with driveway, um, house, the proposed garage ADU and, and the proposed deck. And I, I just need to react to something that was stated by one of the board members earlier is having to look at, you know, whether the, um, the ADU it is tremendously more intrusive than a garage by virtue of being on the second floor. And it, I just have to state in the, in the strongest of terms that it is, um, you know, a, a one story garage would not raise the issues that are of such tremendous concern to us in terms of being able to use our backyard. Um, anyone who's, I, I don't know if any um, board members have had an opportunity to uh, visit our neighborhood, but the anyway, if they have, they realize that the neighborhood uh, is con it's comprised of a number of very small lots. And we're all sort of on top of each other. We can practically pass the salt shaker across uh, to the, the people that live next to us. And, um, but it's the space between the buildings that give us a sense of uh, openness and uh, a little bit of privacy. Um, the lots are all non-conforming, less than the minimum of 6,000. Most surrounding uh, 106 Mount Vernon are less than 5,000 square foot, including uh, including 106 and including 79 Situate Street where we live. Our backyards are small, but they are incredibly precious. We enjoy them a great deal. Um, it's really the only yard space that we have. We don't have yard space on the side. We don't have usable yard space in the front. So the backyard is it. It's where we spend all of our outdoor time um, in all seasons, except for the one that we're just getting out of. And, and we feel that enforcement of the zoning rules is particularly critical when a neighborhood is this tight. Um, there, they are, uh, the houses are very close together, but they're lined up with open space in between them, as I think I mentioned before. So we can see past the houses behind and in front of us to the other side of the next street. And this is a consistent pattern on Mount Vernon Street and on Situate Street. And uh, unfortunately, this proposal would pay, place a huge tall barrier across our backyard and, and destroy any sense of privacy that we have in the back of our house and block a lot of light and air and our current views of the sky and trees. It would block the space between the houses where we can now see across to the other side of Mount Vernon. And I, I have a couple of pictures to show you mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. So this is currently our backyard. We still had a little bit of snow on the ground at the time. And uh, as you can see, both on the left and the right of, uh, of 106 Mount Vernon, which is the blue house, 
um, we can see um, across to the other side of the street. And this is what it would look like with the uh, new proposed building. It would completely block um, our ability to uh, have a view, uh, that, that sense that we are part of a larger um, you know, area and that we can see that space um, across the street um, on Mont Vernon Street. And we would be you know, sort of blocked in by that huge structure, which would be, you know, very close to to our fence and and our fence is as tall as it's supposed to be in Arlington six feet but you can see that the the height of that building would just completely overtake um, our backyard and this is from the second story of our house looking at the backyard and there it is with the the garage ADU so um, it really will have a substantial impact on, you know, the the outdoor space that we that we currently enjoy um, as it looks now. Um, this shows you how the property would look. It, it actually is from um, 106 Mount Vernon, and um, how much of the lot will be filled up um, with buildings and deck um, if this proposal goes forward, um, and it it. I mean, it just, while this would be a perfectly fine plan um, on a bigger lot, uh, this is just, uh, re represents a huge mass on a very small lot. And um, we will be the um, unfortunate uh, rear butters who will be facing this, this big block. Um, we also wanted to mention the, the flooding issue that um, has been previously mentioned, and I don't really, I don't really understand how that's been addressed in the plans and whether it would be effective. But um, we are downhill from um, their property; uh, their property slopes down from front to back, and um, we do already get flooding. I mean, just uh, a week or two ago, when we had those heavy rains, we had flooding in our basement and in our backyard. And um, it seems that that is likely to increase if uh, additional structures or non-porous land surfaces are added. And uh, by my calculation, or actually my husband's calculation, he's the numbers guy, um, the proposal calls for an additional 100 square feet of driveway plus the garage ADU with a 520 square foot footprint. So um, we're concerned that that additional amount of non-porous area could could really um, worsen our our problems with flooding. Uh, in addition, um, the driveway is lengthened uh, only by about five feet, but it also goes past the back of the existing house. There's another hundred feet of uh, hundred square feet of driveway there as well. Is is there a lot more to your presentation? No, I think we're we're pretty much um, we're pretty much at the end. So um, I can uh, turn uh, turn it over to whoever's next. Thank you both thank very you much. For, for thank you for hearing yeah, us. Thank you. We appreciate it. Appreciate Certainly. It. Um, next on the list is identified as Cornell. Yes, so you can, can you hear, hear me? me? Uh, yes, please. Name and address for the record. Okay, my name is Andrew Cornell. I'm on 100 Situate Street which is up the road across Spring Ave from um, where Gail and Ned live. And I just want to express to the board that I'm very, very concerned about this project if it goes through increasing, um, basically taking over open space, which as people have mentioned is really at a premium in this neighborhood or in all of Arlington. It's just not, correct and it's not right and it's not why people moved um, into this neighborhood and i'm especially concerned with housing prices going up people are going to be improving their houses um, adding on to it and i think this just sets a very very dangerous precedent for all the reasons that um, those opposed to this have already brought up anything further no, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, next on the list is uh, Zoe Cronin. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Zoe Cronin and I live at 121 Mount Vernon Street, which is diagonal across the street. 
from Bailey and Sean Snyder, and hopefully soon to be Marty. So first, I just wanted to say that the Snyders were super welcoming to us when we moved in six years ago. Um, they couldn't be better neighbors and more beloved and more considerate towards everybody on the block and welcoming and inclusive. I feel really lucky to live on this block. And I think um, it's something where it's a block where family comes first. And that's really what's striking to me about what the Snyder's proposal is, which is for them to be able to take care of their mom. And when we talk about neighborhood character, to me, that's what Mount Vernon Street is all about. And I applaud the Snyders for what they're doing for their mom. And I think it's it's really a beautiful and nice thing. And as far as the way it looks, to me, it perfectly matches my vision of the character of the neighborhood and reflects our values. Um, I just wanted to add that Marty is here three days a week anyway. Um, so all of the discussion about whether extra people are moving in or extra people are gonna be parking, she's already here because she helped to raise um, the Snyder's two children the whole time that they were in babies and in preschool. So I just want to strongly support their application. Thank you so much. My neighbors come over for connection. Uh, uh, next on our list uh, is Liz Bombs. Bombsy, thank you. Um, my name is well, beg yeah. your pardon. No, that's totally fine. Uh, my name is Liz Bomsey. This is my wife, huh? Kate Hurd. We live at 67 Newport Street. So um, just sort of two streets over on the same block, basically, as, as many of you. Um, we want to echo the uh, strong support of all the other folks who spoke already um, for the Snyder's project. Um, uh, we are now Arlington residents largely because Bailey and Sean um, introduced us to the wonderful community here. Um, we've been here about five years now. Um, and uh, we have been the beneficiary of the community support of the Snyders who rallied hard for us when our younger child was diagnosed with a critical illness a couple of years ago. Marty especially was here multiple days a week, bringing us food, um, picking up our kids at school when we need backup. She's like a second grandmother in our house. Um, We're both only children and we feel, Bailey, we really, really want to support you in this because this is intergenerational living and what we sacrifice in space and living in Arlington, we make up in leaps and bounds in community and support and everything that goes along with, with family. So we really strongly support this project. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, next on the list is Julie Gibson. Hello, uh, my name is hey. Gibson. I live at 12 Puritan Road, so I'm sort of a neighbor a few streets over. Um, but I've been following Bailey's uh, journey here. And, you know, just a few notes while I'm listening tonight is that uh, I definitely understand that this is a dense town and I understand everybody's concerns. Um, but my understanding of, of, you know, I've also followed the ADU as, as my 80 year old dad has had many struggles of his own and I've sort of followed Bailey. Um, but my understanding of the ADU is that the new statute strongly was supported by town meetings specifically for the purpose of affordable housing. And I think what no one has mentioned, although it is specific to Bailey, is that her mom was a public servant. She worked uh, with special needs folks for many, many years. I don't know, 30 plus years. Uh, she's exactly, in my opinion, what ADUs were made for. Um, so as I listen to this meeting, to me, it sounds a lot about semantics, right? So if they can build a garage and then build an ADU by right, the question is really about deck access between the two houses and whether or not that becomes the quote attached or detached. 
Um, I mean, I think we're talking specifically in this case, but I understand that it's bigger picture about whether, you know, it's unfortunate that the neighbors didn't just approach directly because they probably would have had a conversation about this. But uh, I think specifically we're talking about the semantics of whether or not the deck constitutes open space or because of its height, uh, because of the topography of, of the lot, whether or not the height uh, qualifies as open space or not open space. And I don't know that any of us have a, an answer for that tonight. Um, but, you know, to me, this is exactly what ADUs are meant for. They're meant for uh, intergenerational living. They're meant for folks who need affordable housing. They're meant for folks who are assisting, you know, people in the community to go on to be able to give back to the community. And I think that's exactly what the Snyders do. I mean, you know, Bailey works at the Boys and Girls Club with uh, inner city kids. I mean, this is this is like the exact situation that I could imagine ADU being um, specifically designed for. And I think, you know, I just want to echo the, the same about Marty. Their mom has already been there for um, eight, nine years with their kids many days a week. I don't think she parks in front of the fire hydrant. I think she's already parking in the driveway. They already park their cars in the driveway. So I I, I don't imagine that this would be any sort of um, hindrance on traffic or any of that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next on the list is uh, Paul Tannenbaum. Um, I'm unmuted. Oh, okay. Unmute. Yep, we can hear you. Are you? Oh, oh. oh but you're freezing up a little bit. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul Tannenbaum. I live at uh, 108. Your connection is. Did you mute it? Can you hear me now? Not muted. Yeah, it's just that the connection is freezing up a little bit. Do we want to try turning off the video just okay. to see if that keeps it? I live at uh, 109 Mount Vernon Street, uh, directly across. Hold on. How's that? I'll try it again. Oh. Um, can you hear me now? No. I can hear you now, yes. Okay. Um, I've lived here since 1977, so I may be one of the uh, longest uh, residents of Arlington on this on this call. Uh, look, I'm I'm in support of uh, what Bailey and their family's trying to do. And uh, the prior uh, presenter actually covered a lot of my uh, points. Uh, I've been here through a lot of construction and there's other uh, of us on this uh, call right now who have done construction. I mean, my, my addition done many years ago, you know, was an uh, addition of a bathroom and two bedrooms and a family room and, and, a, and a full basement, finished basement. And others, uh, you know, Jimmy Fahey's on the line. He's put on additions. And there's been changes in the neighborhood. And the lots have gotten smaller. Every one of us, as mentioned earlier, has a small lot. And any change, you know, makes some impact on what you get to see and don't see. Uh, you know, so in my yard is now smaller. And my neighbors, uh, you know, have compost bins, two of them behind me. And so, you know, when changes happen, you make changes. So we put up shrubs to provide the greenery to go forward. And, and others, you know, there's going to be change and you can make it better for yourself even when your neighbors make changes. And there's been discussion about noise, whether you have a, a deck and you have a party or you have people in your backyard and you have a party you're going to end up with the same kind of noise factors. Uh, when I when I listen to the technical issues back and forth among the board members, it appears 
that there is a there's a at this oh Mr. we're losing you again just the way it's been and I I just did it in my head just looking at the size of the of the deck uh, it was easily uh, over 25 feet if you just look at the dimensions and then so the question is if the deck is open space then it looked like the quick math that the 25 foot square was going to be achieved and um, and then the question is whether the deck connected deck a deck connected to the house is a connection under the law. So I think the board has a few things to do that seem to be uh, very straightforward. It's either going to be it's uh, okay the way it's designed or it's not okay. And then the Snyders will have to look at what it, what adjustments need to be made. But I think the, the neighbors, all of us, uh, accept change. It, it's, it's just what goes on. And I think it's a good idea for building your family and i think it's a good idea for the community thanks and i'm going to say one more thing this is marcy paul's wife i've been on watching everything one thing i'll say about this deck because of the design of marty uh, of sean and bailey's house the backyard because of the slope the basement's above ground so for this family to have connection with each other you have to have you almost have to have that deck so marty you go in their front door out the back on the deck to her building without having to use any stairs that is critical we are now in our 70s and we're very aware of the aging process and i think it would be a big mistake to not have that deck i think it's a very practical brilliant idea for people who are aging who who just need extra help that's all i'm gonna right now i think right. it's a good idea thank you um uh, uh lindsay whitaker hi thank you um i'm lindsay whitaker this is my husband andy we live at 137 mount vernon street and owned this house for nearly 12 years um i want to point out that i'm actually a huge proponent of ADUs and intergenerational living. Uh, my mom grew up in an intergenerational house. It's super important and she speaks fondly of it. As did I. As did Andy, <laughs> um, as his grandmother lived in the house with him. Um, and a year ago, my parents who are not local, my dad nearly died. Um, he had sepsis. Uh, so I was driving back and forth to New York very frequently. Bailey and her family, um, including Marty, bent over backwards to help us, which shows what an asset they are to the community. I also want to be clear that according to my interpretation of current ADU laws in Arlington, um, it, the ADU cannot be rented out full stop. So I want to, I know that kind of came up earlier as a question, so I want to make sure that that's very clear. This is not a building that can be rented out, sold separately, or any of that. Um, and lastly, you know, as, as um, uh, you know, the, the speaker before me pointed out, you know, part of living in community, part of a community is accepting change. And I understand that communities and neighborhoods change, right? Communities, they need to adapt to the needs of its people and moving forward that's including intergenerational living that's including being part of the sandwich generation so i just want to say that we at 137 support bailey and sean and their variance proposal thank you and i would just add to that and this echoes what julie had said um that this change for change's sake isn't isn't automatically good but the town meeting has already expressed the kind of change that it would like to see um, which is why these ADU uh, guidelines exist, um, and why, you know, the uh, it would it would be a very fitting example um, for when any kind of variance along these lines should be approved. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, Dan Porcini. 
Diane Porcini? Last try, Ms. Puccini. There we yes. go. Okay, here we go. Yes, my name is Diane Pochini. I Pochini. live at 75 Situate Street, which is uh, behind the um, house we're talking about, kind of uh, across Kitty Connor. And um, I have a nice backyard, have lived here almost 60 years. And I am very worried about the new uh, construction. Um, we already have water coming from that uh, property in heavy rainstorms because it's up higher than uh, my land and the house next door has had water problems. Um, it also, uh, the privacy issue, uh, this uh, enormous uh, addition and deck looks right over into my yard and I'm just not very comfortable with that at all. I understand all the wonderful things people have said about the uh, people wanting to do this for their mother, um, but I uh, have to consider um, the neighborhood and the neighbors and the people around. I'm elderly uh, also. Uh, there's a lot of violations on the building and a lot, a lot of codes that I saw were not uh, in, in form. And also another thing, I don't know if anybody's mentioned uh, the fire hazard uh, being so close to all of these houses. That's something else I'm concerned about. Um, and I just am not, uh, I, I'm not, uh, for this addition on that house at all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, next is, uh, Trish Boudreau. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, Trish Boudreau, I am located at 94 Mount Vernon Street, um, just a couple of doors down from, from um, Sean and Bailey. And I wanted to express my support for this project. Um, as many on the phone have already um, spoke about, I actually met Marty uh, before I met Sean and, and Bailey. Um, I was walking with my daughter at the time and Marty was with um, Sean and, and Bailey's daughter, who's the same age as mine, and she introduced herself. And since then, um, you know, we've come to know Sean, Bailey, and Marty very well over the last um, eight years. Um, and I have been at Mount Vernon for um, just over 10 years with my husband, and we'll, we'll tell you that Sean and Bailey and Marty have only enhanced the neighborhood um, since I have moved in. I understand the neighborhood um, to be, has always been a, an incredible neighborhood and community um, where there is a tremendous amount of um, families and um, diversity on in within the neighborhood and the neighborhood my understanding has changed and over the last um, you know prior to 10 years ago and I feel like they have only um, added to um, the the culture and the in bringing the community back together again and making it where where neighbors do help one another Sean and Bailey will literally um, help help their neighbors in any way that they can, whether that be setting up a, a swing set in the backyard to um, to snowing blow um, blowing snow. Um, Marty has been there alongside um, so much as she's picked my daughter up from school along with um, Shauna Bailey's daughter. So you know, I think inter intergenerational. Um, is so important in this community. I think it adds to the community um, and wanna again support, wanna say that I completely support this project um, for Sean and Bailey and Marty and um, and just wanna thank you once again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last speaker on our list is 
um, has spoken before, um, so this will be for a second time. So I would just ask that um, you be brief uh, again, it's Scott Tower. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, this is Scott Tower. Um, there were a couple of issues that I thought um, I would like to bring up. There was an issue about um, need, not needing stairs to go between the two houses, but but because of the grade of the yard, um, there's stairs. Stairs are unavoidable for one for one thing. Um, there was also somewhere in in some of the uh, proposal documentation about the water usage, um, implying that there was only going to be a bathroom but there's a bathroom and a kitchen. So, um, and washer dryer, I assume. So that's all, um, all not accounted for. Um, and in addition, um, you know, it's just it's the, the deck is going to be so raised that it's difficult. Um, th there's no way we can, we can essentially isolate ourselves from, from the um, neighbors. Um, Okay, so we are the we are the most impacted, the rear and and the the right and left side of butters, and um, I believe that um, that this deck will be intrusive on our property, and and as the structure will be, will it is not fitting with the neighbors. Now we like, you know, we like Sean and Bailey and wow. all the neighbors seem to but that's different from um from a, from a permanent structure that we all have to um live with and sets a bad precedent for the rest of the neighborhood that's it okay thank you mr tower um i had said that mr tower was going to be the the last um person to to speak tonight so i know uh another hand has gone up subsequently um but I do need to, I had intended to end public discussion about 23 minutes ago. So um, I do appreciate everyone's uh, passion on this and uh, all those uh, speaking on both sides. Um, so coming back to the board, um, there definitely are several several issues we need to, um, to sort of get to the heart of. And I think part of that too is determining you know, where we have the information we need, where we would be looking uh, for additional information. Um, so the big, I think the, the big question in front of us is, is the is the variance question. Um, because the, the rules for a variance are very strict in terms of what we are allowed to, um, to accept uh, as a part of a variance application. And um, there's, I know that Mr. Uh, Mr. Hanlon has expressed um, a slightly di uh, a different interpretation on the usable open space. Um, and I just go back to to him. Um, if you had uh, Pat, had you had a conversation with Inspectional Services specifically about that question? Um, <clears throat> it's really it was just an email exchange, and the issue that has been raised about what the what Mike has told me is that decks usually count, decks count as usable open space, and that the stairs would not interrupt the continuity so that they wouldn't they wouldn't prevent you from having a, a 25 foot um, uh, a 25 foot square. Um, the question that arose tonight is, well, but does that make a difference? maybe a deck that's more than a certain level high is treated would be treated differently. I've not had a discussion with him on that other than that the existence of the stairs mm -hmm. and therefore some element of height uh, was implicit in the question that I asked him. Yeah, then, um, I would ask a similar question if Ms. Elliston, if she had had a conversation with inspectional services about the interpretation on unusable open space. Um, I was under the impression that the deck would not count um, after showing them the survey and um, our um, site plan. Okay, so you had the conversation with inspectional services and they indicated you would you would need a variance. So it wasn't inspectional services, but it was, um, uh, I think it was Rick Valorelli um, okay. with me 
about needing the variance as well as the special permit. Um, so I had applied for the special permit for the setbacks, um, not realizing that it also triggers the variance for the usable open space, the 25 by 25. Um, but I guess it's a little frustrating that also in the zoning, it says that the 20 by 20 for a new pro, you know, a new project would be passable, a new house construction. So, um, yeah. you know, there's obviously a bunch of different information that um, I was a, a little unclear of. Okay. Um, had you investigated looking at what would be required to do the, to try to keep the addition within the boundaries of the setbacks? Um, so, I mean, we could, but the garage below would essentially be unusable because of how the driveway works. Um, mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to maneuver a car into it, um, which then sort of defeats the purpose of us having Marty on the same level. So you essentially have a ground level um, ADU that, you know, could be within their yard, um, which is, you know, definitely a possibility. I think at this point, um, the homeowner and I, you know, are considering if this isn't attached, which is essentially just the deck, we could build this by right, but really that isn't desirable to them. So um, I think at the end of the day, it's really going to be a question of, you know, the, the attached or not attached really does affect their lifestyle and then really does yeah. affect, you know, um, the usability of it and, um, you know, if they're, if, the, if that's worth it to them. So I'm curious if you had the garage and you turned it sideways and put it against the back of the house, you could come down the driveway, do a hard right into the garage at the lower level, and then with the ADU above would be at the main level of the house, um, but you would be away from the side yard and the rear yard setbacks? Um, yeah, I think that um, could definitely be a possibility. I think the drawbacks would be, you know, again, their access to the yard and yep. the light, you know, for them to access it, because then essentially they'd have to go through their, their the mom's unit to get to what yeah. would be the back um, yard there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there definitely are possibilities for us to tweak things. And um, I think that we're definitely open to making adjustments that will, um, you know, make the board happy as well as um, the neighbors. Okay. Yeah, because my, my, my sense is that the board has some questions that we would need to get resolved uh, from the, the zoning enforcement officer, specifically about the attached versus detached question and the usable open space question so that we have a very definitive determination mm -hmm. uh, from him. Um, Mr. Chair. You, Mr. Holly. I have one clarification or question here. I could be possibly wrong here. Um, I'm looking at the district regulations table and for R0, R R1 and R2 districts, for an accessory building greater than 80 square feet and private garages, the height maximum is 20 feet. Right now, it's 24.1 feet is what I see on the side elevation. So that could change a few things, what what you suggest, or not what you suggested. I meant um, with the whole deck and, you know, and Would the height. 20 feet be from average grade? Um, because possibly. there's a big, yeah, uh, slope there. I um, think it's 21.4 is as I see it right now on your drawings. Is that too from the average grade? Yes. Yeah. But I, again, if that were, we would be very okay with modifying it to get um, the 20 feet. So that would be the um, accessory. Yeah. Um, um, right. It, mm -hmm. So that would, that would be, if it was considered not attached, we'd also have to meet the 20 foot. Um, so a small adjusted adjustment to that height would be um, fine on our end. Right, if it is not considered a type, that is correct. Yes, yep, and we would be open to that. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Are there questions from the board, either for the applicant or questions that we think we would want to have 
with the um, with inspectional services. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I realize how complex this can seem in trying to knit these various provisions together to come up with a reasonable solution. I mean, normally what we're looking for is the applicant to say, this is what we are proposing, and then let us sort of apply the rules that we have uh, with regard to the proposal. And I realize that this may be a little bit different I, I do think that, you know, based upon what Ms. O'Connor had said, um, I, if I'm not misquoting her and if she's here, she can correct me, but it seemed to me like there was uh, an indication on her part that the fact of the connection from the deck to the building would in fact mean that it would have to conform to the zoning setbacks. And um, Mr. Chairman, if mm -hmm. uh, I see that she's just checked in, could I? clarify that with her? Was that the position that uh, you enunciated? Yes, because that's the position of the code enforcement officer, Mr. Champa, that the, they're um, uh, interrelated and connected. They're integral part under, I think it was 5.13.3b. So that was one of the issues. Okay. okay. So that clearly is something that I would like to get clarification on. The other thing um, is that I know we were talking about the deck and whether or not that's usable open space. And I was just looking at the definition and I don't know whether or not the deck is considered the roof uh, because I know it says that it's roof that's less than or equal to 10 feet above the level of the lowest story used for dwelling purposes. So if that's what we are trying to determine, I think that that again, you know, needs to be figured out Mm -hmm. as well with the building department, uh, what they consider to be open space. Uh, because I don't think that we, we're stumbling around a little bit when it comes to that question. Yeah. And I think we do need to have some clarification. And then we have to see, because I know I've, I've looked at Ms. O'Connor's uh, letter and you know she intimated that the property, the usable open space was being reduced from 2,150 square feet to zero. Yeah. And whatever the numbers actually are, I do think that we need to get clarification from uh, the building department. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just want to be a little clearer on the, to me, the issue about attached or unattached and so forth and are all, I, I think of basically the getting a variance as a cliff that the applicant will just fall over if that's what is required, because it seems to me exceedingly difficult given the strict state rules that we have on giving variances um, or um, or being able to being able to really grapple with this. So it's important to do these things and just I just want to be clear that the section that Ms. O'Connor cited, um, what it says is an accessory building attached to the principal building shall be considered as an integral part thereof and shall be subject front side and rear, rear yard requirements applicable to the principal building per section 5.4.2. The question I originally raised is whether in fact it is attached to the principal building given the definition of an attached building mm -hmm. in the zoning bylaw. And that's a question of law. That's not a question of judgment. Uh, it's what the zoning bylaw says. And uh, uh, I, we need to kind of work that out, but it's a very important thing because it relates, because without that, you have to do something about the deck. The deck is what's creating the attachment. And I think that if you get into, you need a zoning variance territory, it's quicksand and it's it's you, there's no exit from it. So these kinds of things seem very technical. I think one of the speakers indicated that and they, it is very technical, but very big things that matter to lots of people sometimes turn on what seem like very, very small things that because of the law, they, they make the difference between being able to do things and, and not. But I don't consider uh, the section that, that Ms. O'Connor's 
uh, cited as answering the question. It really is what poses the question. It's 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 what happens if you decide that if you decide that it that it uh, it is attached. It tells you what the consequence is. And the question is whether there's an art, art, argument that we should be accepting uh, to apply what I think is the plain language of the zoning by law, even though that has not been what the way in which it has generally been interpreted, according to Mr. Mr. Champa, that their their regular practice is to treat the uh, deck as 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 uh, as connecting buildings, and that's something that that just happens. And this case poses that very clearly because of the. And there, and we need to, I think, look carefully at whether, at at the, what the language of the zoning bylaw says and what it means for us here. And it's always difficult to do that, especially in the light of a brand new program that has changed the purposes of the zoning bylaw to, among other things, include things like encouraging intergener intergeneration interge intergeneration uses. And other kinds of uses as well. The AD user have a separate set of purposes that are no less a part of the purpose of the zoning by law as the provisions in section one. But in any event, we need to we need to go there. And I think that there there has to be a conversation both with inspectional services to see what they think and how they how they address these issues. And separately, Ms. Ellison has to be working with, with her clients and others to see what they can do to to somehow manage to get things done, given the interpretations that uh, are going to be given this. So there's lots of work for everybody to do here. And this is not, is not as, as crystalline as many of the cases that we have before us. No, I think that's very well taken. I think it, you know, I, th I would very strongly encourage the, the applicant to, um, to speak with inspectional services and to, figure out what they can do short of needing a variance. Um, because the as as has been stated several times, the first question in whether or not a variance can be granted is is there something unique about the shape, so, soil, and topography of the site which is unique to that and is not general to the district. And I think that's a very, very difficult case to make on this site where essentially every single lot is the same shape, the same size and on the same side of the hill. Um, and so I, I, I think that the, the best course for the applicant um, is to speak with inspectional services and really sort of find out what, what they could do short of needing a variance. And in the same, the board can do the same um, with inspectional services to sort of figure out exactly how, what their interpretation is on these questions so that the board is better, um, is better prepared. And then I would recommend to the applicant that um, that we continue this hearing um, until our next scheduled hearing, which if I'm not mistaken, April, Tuesday, April 11th. Let's check the calendar. Yep, yeah, it would be Tuesday, yeah. Uh, would the applicant be amenable to that? Yes, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions that the board wants to raise at this time so that we're sure that we have responses ahead of the 11th? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? Um, I don't have them all in front of me, but there are several other things that have been raised. Um, things like the floor area ratio and, and other things which are tricky because in the table, um, like for example, on maximum floor area in an R1 zone for a single family detached dwelling, there is no requirement that relates to, to the floor area, but other permitted structures mm -hmm. do have a 30.35. We have in, an, in the Allen Street case treated the other uh, permitted structures as really essentially part of the whole thing and the whole, we treated a garage in that case as being part of the single family detached dwelling. And that involves somewhat different issues, but it's not an easy thing to do to figure out whether the 0.35 would apply in this case or not. And, this, and the ADU bylaw itself 
uh, suggest that the the ADU is treated as that is to say, if you have an ADU, it's a, still a single family dwelling. Um, so we think the various other things that have been raised, lot coverage and so forth, we ought to at least work our way through and see what inspectional services think and also consider how they relate to the decisions we've already taken in, in related issues. All right, then. Um, so then the board would need a motion to continue um, this hearing um, until Tuesday, April 11th. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I have a second. second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Just make sure that the Applicant is in agreement with that, so we would be continuing to Tuesday, April 11th at 7.30. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, I, so, sorry, I ask a quick question. Will there be a, a, a summary <clears throat> given sure. to us on what the topics will be that we'll cover for the next meeting so I can sort of check off um, what I need clarity on? Um, I can send you the list of things that I was going to go over with inspectional services. Okay. Um, but I, I would encourage you to, to look at, you know, and to, to sort of figure out what you could do short of needing a variance. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Then a vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 106 uh, Mount Vernon Street. So thank you all very much for your participation and everything this evening. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to the next item on our agenda. I greatly appreciate the patience of the applicants for 121 Park Avenue. Um, I could have the applicants introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and the board. Uh, my name is Bala um, and my wife, uh, Lena, was the one who made the application. Uh, I also have along with me, Paul Miller, who's our architect. Uh, and he'll be walking us through the plan uh, as far as the addition goes. Uh, we've lived in uh, Park Ave for the last four years. Um, and we moved from uh, India, Singapore, and then here. Uh, we really enjoy our life in, uh, in Arlington, and we love the neighborhood. Um, what, when we bought the house, we didn't realize how much we missed the space we have in the ground floor. So the addition that we intend to do is to add additional space where we uh, plan to have a, uh, a kitchen and a casual living space. We have a large lot at the back. It's about 12,000 square feet. And the addition is for about 1,000 square feet. Uh, and the variance request is, is primarily because it's it's about the 750 square feet um, as, per, as per the guideline. So that's what we are requesting the variance for. Um, and I highly, highly appreciate to, everyone. Sorry to cut you off, Paula. It's a special permit that we're, special we're permit, requesting. Yeah. Just to be clear. Special permit, yeah. Um, so that's that's the request, uh, and really appreciate everyone staying back this late uh, to go through it. So with that I'll hand it over to Paul Great. to go through the details. Mr. Miller, would you like to share your screen? Yes, please. Um, so Ralston, if you could go ahead and elevate him. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You are okay. all set. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and thanks to the chair and to the board for uh, allowing us to present our project. Um, I thought I would just quickly start with a 
broad overview to show where the house is that we're proposing the, the addition to. This is 121 Park Avenue here in the, the center of my screen. <clears throat> um, we're between the water tower uphill and, and Massachusetts Avenue uh, downhill. And we're proposing, as Bala explained, an addition off the rear of the house which will require a special permit under the, the large additions um, section of the, the bylaw. And I'm gonna switch over to some drawings. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen still? Thank you. Uh, so a couple of uh, contextual photos uh, that show the existing house. It's a two and a half story colonial house uh, with a, a fairly generous backyard, as Bala already stated, it's a 12,000 square foot lot. And we're proposing to add a, a roughly 1,000 foot addition off the, the back of the house. Um, existing first floor plan. And I'm going to skip right over to the proposed first floor plan. This is the area here that comes off to kind of to the page left that where we'll be adding the addition. And I'll show that in elevation as well. Uh, the front of the house is the right elevation here. There's no proposed change to the front elevation. Uh, the rear elevation is on the left side of the page and you can see the smaller volume in the foreground of this image is the is the addition and a side elevation looking from the south you can see the existing house at the right and the addition coming off of it to the left there's a portion of the addition with a flat roof and there's a portion of the addition that has a a pitched roof and this is the elevation uh, from the north Um, and those are all the drawings that we um, intended to show. I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, that the board or members of the public have about the project. All right, thank you very much. Um, so the addition is just a single story addition, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then the right side setback, um, I think you have it listed as 11.7, but there's some portions that stick out that are bring it down to 10 foot three. And I just wanted to confirm that that's, that was correct. That's correct. Yes, there's a small, I'm, I've just pulled up the plot plan. Uh, yep. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, there's a small bump out on the right side of the drawing here. That's the north side of the addition that, that comes out an additional roughly foot and a half and comes within 10, uh, 10.3 feet of the property line. And that's as close as it comes to the property line. Okay. And if, if I remember correctly, there are no significant trees in this area. Is that correct? That's correct. There's one small tree that, that uh, is close to the existing house that we will be taking down. The, uh, the property does have a number of beautiful large trees, and those are all being maintained. Okay. And then um, I, I noticed when I was looking at the, the property, how are you looking to stage the construction and access the rear? So there, it's a good question. There's a, a, a double gate at the front of the house here, roughly where, um, if you can see my mouse, <clears throat> the 11.8 foot uh, dimension is shown on the plot plan. That's a double swinging gate that can open up to roughly 10 feet wide. There, there's a contractor who's already been involved with the pre-construction phasing, um, of the, and pricing of the project, and they will be bringing all their equipment through that double gate through the side yard. Okay. And they're not concerned about the, the grade change and the sort of the, the support of the soil with the that low wall that's there now? They are not. Okay. And just to be clear, the uh, which low wall are you referring I, to? I thought there was a low wall just off the, basically along the property line. 
but maybe it's just a slope. There, there. I'm not aware of a low wall there. Bala, is okay. there a low wall on? No, that there's side? there's no low wall. It's there's a there's there's a low wall running along this side of the property for for a portion okay. of it, uh, maybe kind of like that. Um, but we're not doing any work on that side of the property. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I know that the, the adjacent house on the north side is set significantly lower. It is. It's a it's a change in topography only. Oh, okay. And all of the there's a, a fairly substantial uh, kind of shrubs on that side of the property, and those are all to remain. Great. Questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I just had one question um, um, for Mr. Miller. Um, so the um, when we were looking at elevation, the flat portion of roof, that uh, that's a terrace, correct? Correct, yes. That will be a terrace with a walkout from an existing bedroom. Okay. So will that have, you know, guardrails and other stuff that we won't be seeing on the elevations right now, maybe not developed yet? That's a good question. Um, I believe we... There's a low parapet wall here that's okay. only a couple of feet high. And our intention is to put a very minimal, uh, it, it's not designed yet, but some kind of minimal metal rail that brings it up to the required 36 inches above the deck surface. It will be something similar to what I'm sketching here. Got it. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, I was wondering what any um, sustainability features are going to be part of the addition, um, considering where the town of Arlington is going in terms of um, sustainable building practices, especially having the specialized code on the, um, the town meeting uh, coming up. Uh, so just kind of curious of where this project might be going in, in that direction. Good question. Thanks for that. Um, something that's important to me as an architect, the work that I do, I feel that one of the ways that I can make a difference is by, as a baseline, making sure that all of my, the buildings that I design are as energy efficient and sustainable as possible. So for instance, in this building, we've proposed uh, continuous exterior insulation and high quality air sealing techniques that we take it upon ourselves to help the contractor through in the construction process. Um, the insulation spec for this house is two inches of continuous um, uh, mineral wool board on the walls, as well as three inches of continuous uh, foam on the roof. So we, we are going above and beyond the required insulating co current code insulating values uh, at the walls. We've also, there's, there are, there's no current plans to install solar panels on the house, but part of the reason that we have a pitched roof here is for the future, for the potential of uh, a future solar array. Uh, it's pointed due south um, and it's a, it's a great pitch uh, for mounting solar panels on. So that's not something that the client is committing to day one, but it's something they're very interested in uh, in the future as their, their budget allows. And I guess just to follow up on that, what about um, HVAC systems? Thanks, uh, good perfect. question. Yeah, uh, this will use a, a mini split okay. to, to heat and cool the addition. So all, all electric, uh, we haven't gone into specifying appliances yet, but I always encourage my clients to consider all electric appliances in the kitchen as well um, because of the known environmental benefits. That's all. Oh, great, thank you. Um, just ask Mr. Real, can you go back to the Google Street View? Yes. Um, I think I'm, 
Can you see it now, or do I need to stop and reshare? Oh, sh um, I can I can do that. It's uh, yeah, I, I it's you're, it's you're making me yeah. I just have to choose one window at a time. Okay, how about now? It is started. I can see it. There it is. So on the right hand side, yes, there's definitely a low wall in this photo. Yep, from right. twenty December twenty twenty two. I see it. Yes. So I just want to make sure that construction loading on that section of ground is not going to undermine the stability of that wall, which is likely non-engineered. So what I can tell you is that the we had to file a stormwater uh, permit application yep. mm -hmm. um, as part of this project. And we needed to have test pits dug in the backyard. And so the contractors already brought a small excavator back there to do that digging. And there, was, there were no issues. As far as I know, and I'm not, I'm not a contractor, I'm not building the project, but as far as I know, there's no plan to bring any machinery heavier than, than that uh, uh, back uh, to, to do the work. So they're not going to try to bring a cement truck to the rear yard. They're just going to pipe it from the front. Yes. Okay. There's, I don't, the, the, uh, there's, I don't think there's any way a cement truck could fit back there. Okay. Yeah. And you know, if, if that, uh, if that kind of staging became a problem, then we might choose to use cement blocks instead of a port in place wall. Other questions from the board? Go ahead and get ready to open the public uh, for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Those who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling by phone, please dial star nine. Um, you'll be called upon by the host to ask to give your name and address given time for your questions and comments. All questions to be addressed through the chair, please remember to speak clearly. Um, and once all public questions or comments have been addressed or we've hit 11, oh dear goodness, um, <laughs> then the public comment period will be closed. Uh, so with that, a very familiar hand, Mr. Steve Moore. That's overly familiar at this point, I'm sure, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, um, I also noted that wall and noticed uh, various street map pictures that showed it and then showed it disappearing in other pictures. I didn't quite understand that either. So that is a good catch. That wall, I believe, does exist. <laughs> and as a practical matter, is this uh, addition going to be poured on a slab, or is it planning to have some sort of small basement type system? Uh, the plan is to have a basement underneath the kitchen area and a crawl space beneath the remainder of the addition, which will serve as a dining room, living room space. Okay, Mr. Chair, then it sounds like a concrete or cement truck is required. Uh, or like you said, maybe you would offer concrete blocks instead, but I just, as a practical matter, I just don't understand how much in the way of heavy equipment is going to access the back of the lot. I saw there was a very large tree, but it sounds like the applicant is staying away from that side of the property. So that seems to not be an issue, which is wonderful to see because that's a very large tree. Uh, but I just, I don't know. They're pretty close to that neighbor's big bush. That's all I'm thinking. Thanks, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Any other members of the public wishing to oops, any other members of the public wishing to address this evening? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close public comment. Um do believe we are in receipt of a memorandum. Um, 
from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Where are we? Like it was one I just sent last night. Why can't I find it? Let's see if it works for me. Here we go. So this is the memo from the planning department. And they've basic addresses a special permit criteria. Um, the proposal includes a addition with roof terrace, successful with our structure, minor changes to facade, homes of vicinity, included a range of styles, design complements the style of the existing structure, adjacent homes neighborhood, which include a contemporary style home on the abutting property. Uh, visual details include facade articulation, wood cladding, metal roof. Overall proposal would not detrimentally impact the character of the neighborhood. Um, in the opinion of the special services, and they had requested that the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals request a north elevation clarifying exterior materials for the bump out. Um, so that is their request. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing again and ask Mr. Miller if he could bring up his drawings again um, and just go to the north elevation. So just to clarify, so you have the vertical siding um, and then the the that blank portion towards the end that's the bump out, what exactly is that? We hadn't made a determination about what that would be, but it probably will have the same siding. Um, it, it, it will have the same siding as the rest okay. of the addition. Um, the, the siding, uh, well, it may not end up being vertical because of budget constraints on the project. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the that this board weighs in on, the orientation of the siding? Not usually, um, but we could certainly include a condition that you know, that the orientation of the, if the board is so inclined that the orientation of the siding is, it can be either way. I think if we were, if, if you're looking to substantially change it to some, you know, substantially different material, that might be a question, but if it's similar no. material, but just a different orientation, I don't think that would be an issue. No, if it were up to me, it would be exactly what we've shown here, but um, there are, other constraints at play, um, specifically the budget that may require making it horizontal siding. But I'm happy to commit now to cladding the bump out in the same siding as the rest of the addition. Okay. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chair, question on siding. Would, would this be painted to match the existing, Mr. Miller? So again, I, I originally was hoping that it would be um, a natural wood. Yep. That was the intention from the beginning um, that you know I felt that that material would fit uh, well in the neighborhood, given that there's a sort of transition from colonial style homes to modern style homes. And it would be a, a nice complement to the existing horizontal white clapboard to have a kind of natural, weathered wood look, but I think that, uh, th again, th it may not be in the budget, unfortunately. And so in that case, it will be, end up being a, uh, a painted 
clapboard. Oh, uh, okay. But uh, we're committed to making this an aesthetically pleasing addition, uh, both myself and the client. And we take into consideration what it looks like relative to their house and as well relative to the neighboring properties as well, because we see it all as a, a composition together. So I think that at this point, it's uh, we can't commit to a paint color or a finish. Uh, just because we're, it's still relatively early, uh, in, we're still sorting out the budget. Sure. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, when we eventually, when, if we approve this, the first condition will be that it has to be constructed in accordance with the plans. Uh, and I guess I've never really understood that that would mean that details of this kind that are shown on the plans would be binding and somebody would, if they would, if they had did some sort of engineering on it, that had to get an amendment. I've never seen us come by and do the amendment, but I just wanted to be clear that, I mean, I guess I'm not entirely clear now that with this subject has come up, just what is binding in these plans and what is not. I, I thought that this was, was not, but, but I, Mm -hmm. Beg to be corrected if that's wrong. Would that that would make a difference in how we how hard we look at all the details of the plans? Yeah. So in my experience, I mean, we've there have been minor cha you know changes in color have come you know usually we don't know the color, so it's as tough to sort of know. The only times we've had people come back is if they we had one house where they added a small shed dormer on the front of their garage that wasn't on the plan set. Um, it's more things like that. Um, but when it sort of comes more to coloration and things like that, I think we have, um, yeah, the, obviously the plans don't indicate a color right now. It just indicates that it's, you know, vertical tongue and groove wood siding. Okay. So, um, you know, if it's not vertical tongue and groove wood siding, that becomes a, a bit of a question, but we could just indicate that, you know, that it remained wood siding or, you know, if, if we just, you know, indicate that the applicant has indicated that they may be changing the, the siding and, you know, the board expresses no interest, we could certainly do something <laughs> like that as well. I just, I'd hate to get into a situation where in every case we have to explicitly say what the yeah. applicant is free to do because then every once in a while we'll we'll forget something and then they'll be back before us saying you didn't exclude it so now we have to come back again it has as far as i know it has not generally been a been a problem so no you know, there's nothing to be fixed really i hope no and i th i think there's an i think the inspectional services i feel does a good job interpreting our decisions I'm not overly concerned about there as well. Um, so this is a request for a large addition. So in addition to the standard seven questions that accompany a special permit, uh, the board does need to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. It needs to find that the uh, dimensions and setbacks considered in relation to a, our con, well, dimensions and setbacks are considered in relation to abutting structures and uses and that uh, it's conforming with the purposes of the bylaw. Um, and so in certainly in review of the plan, review of the, um, the, the, the drawing set included and the discussions and uh, the constructability and in regards to the discussion in regards to um, some of the sustainability questions. Um, I have no, I personally have no issue with finding the, um, in favor of the, the criteria for the large addition. Uh, the only condition I would want to add um, would be, Typically, with an addition like this, if 
you know, the in the future, the applicant could add a second floor by right. Um, I think a, a part of this application is that it because it's a single story, it's a different type of project than it would be if it was multi-story. And so for that reason, I would just want to include a condition that a second floor could not be added um, without the approval of the zoning board. Sounds fair to us. Are there any other conditions that members of the board would like to see? Should the board vote to approve this application? The board has three standard conditions, one of which Mr. Hanlon's already alluded to. Um, the first is the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plan and specification submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. Should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified. He's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures that any time he determines that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. And now the additional condition, um, that a second floor may not be added without the approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Are there any further questions or concerns of the board? Um, seeing none, I would ask for a motion. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the application be approved subject to the three standard conditions plus the additional condition that uh, regarding future uh, changes that the uh, chair has read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Any questions from the board on what we are voting for? Seeing none. Yes. Sorry. Nope. Uh, then a roll call vote to the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Rigardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, the motion is approved. Uh, so there's the approval for the special permit for 121 Park Avenue with the three plus one conditions. Uh, so the board will write up a decision and uh, we'll approve the final language at its next scheduled hearing, which is uh, Tuesday, April 11th. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Um, really appreciate the, the time and the help here. Absolutely. And appreciate your patience. Uh, it's never fun going on last, but uh, thank you very much for sticking it out. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. You're welcome. All right. So members of the board, hang on. Um, <laughs> you guys are always so fast to jump off the call. We need enough. We need to have a quorum to actually adjourn. So that's the, that's the, the critical part. Um, so as they said up front, uh, the thirty first is still the last day we can hold a public meeting online. It has been sitting on the desk of the uh, of the governor since last week. So hopefully she will sign it in the next day or so, and we'll be able to keep going online. Uh, but the next scheduled hearing is is the Tuesday, April 11th. Uh, so there are three new cases for that. We have just added two continuances for that evening. So there are five things now on for the 11th. Um, and then Monday, April 17th is the next meeting for 10, 21, 1025 Mass Ave. If there are any outstanding questions, we do wanna to try to resolve them at that meeting. So uh, spend some time going through the materials um, and we would wanna to try to wrap that one up. 
because um, on Tuesday, April 25th, the plan is to start the comprehensive permit hearing cycle for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, and I have asked Mr. Hanlon if he would uh, sort of take the reins on um, coordinating that hearing cycle. So he will be taking uh, taking that on. Um, Mr. Chairman, could you repeat that date for 10 Sunnyside? Basically us for the next, next Tuesday, the 25th of April. Thank you. Thank you all. Anything further? Hi, members of the board. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank... Oh, got ahead of myself. <laughs> Colleen Ralston and Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of our proceedings. It is our, my understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on, on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at pound.arlington.ma. US. That email address is also listed on the zoning to adjourn. Mr. Hanlon, would you like to make a motion to adjourn? Yeah, I couldn't. I got, I missed that last sentence. I, so moved. <laughs> so moved. Second. Thanks. Vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Cadelli. Aye. Mr. Hoffman. Aye. And Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.